Klockan är nio och kammaren... It's nine o'clock and we're in session and we're going to start uh, the date with a foreign policy debate, debating rules. The foreign policy debate is divided into two parts. First, an opening part with the Minister for Foreign Affairs and the representatives from the different parties, uh, then followed by a second part in which other speakers who wish to be given the opportunity to speak are given the floor. The Minister for Foreign Affairs opens the, with uh, the government's statement of foreign policy. No more than 20 minutes, then we'll have speeches from the other parties in the order of the size of each party and uh, these are to be no longer than eight minutes. There is a free right of rejoinder for all of these speeches uh, and we're using the dueling method with uh, no more than two minutes for rejoinder and then one minute. And uh, we're going to start with uh, the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Anne-Linda, please, the floor is yours. Herr Talman. Mr. Speaker. Our security situation is very serious. Russia's increasingly confrontational rhetoric and military activities, both visible and covert, are unacceptable. The heightened Russian military presence at Ukraine's borders and Russian demands for security guarantees, they threaten the very core of European security order. The European security order is not negotiable. Standing up for Ukraine's sovereignty and also territorial integrity is essential for the security of Europe as a whole. Ukraine, like Sweden, has a right to make its own security policy choices. It's not Russia's place to dictate these through threats and violence. The rules of international law on state sovereignty and political independence, these are part of the European security order. The way forward in terms of reducing tensions is continued dialogue and diplomacy. However, at the same time, we need to prepare for the possibility that Russia might choose a different path. Mr Speaker, the right to make your own policy decisions is central to our security. The government does not intend to apply for NATO membership. Our security policy remains firmly in place. Our non-participation in mil military alliances serves us well has served us well and contributes to stability and security in Northern Europe. We combine this with a defence policy that rests on two pillars, strengthened national capabilities and deepened international defence cooperation. Our cooperation with Finland has a special status. Since 2014, we have built up a functioning defence and security network and have concluded over 30 agreements and around 20 cooperation agreements, not least with our Nordic and Baltic neighbours. We are building up our military capabilities, both bilaterally and with NATO, and we are building up credible national defence capabilities through the largest investment in Swedish defence since the 1950s. Sweden will not remain passive if another EU member state or Nordic country suffers a disaster or an attack. We expect these countries to act in the same way if Sweden were affected. An armed attack against Sweden cannot be ruled out. We must therefore be able to both give and receive support, both civilian as well as military. However, we alone make that decision about who, with whom we cooperate and in what forms, in times of peace, in times of crisis and war. Sweden's foreign and policy, security policy builds on cohesion in the EU and increased cooperation on a broad front in the Nordic region, the Baltic Sea region, through the Organisation of Security and Cooperation in Europe, and through deep in partnership with NATO. And international law remain a cornerstone of Swedish foreign policy. A strong transatlantic link is, a vital, is vital for Europe's security. Mr Speaker, we have a number of security policy tools with which to address the deteriorating security situation in Europe. The OSCE is one such important tool, and Sweden recently concluded its term as chair of the OSCE, during which we made an impact that will endure. We strengthened the platform of dialogue, the need for dialogue is greater now than at any time since the end of the Cold War. This was exemplified during the Council of Ministers in Stockholm, where some 50 foreign ministers held important political discussions and made decisions. We also strengthened the platform for conflict resolution. As chair, we focused on conflict resolution in Ukraine, Moldova, Georgia, and also the South Caucasus. Meetings with civil society are always a priority. And the same applied as we were, when we were chair of OSCE. In Russia, the human rights situation has progressively deteriorated. An increasingly repressive society has made it impossible for human rights defenders 
to carry out their important work. The closure of the Human Rights Group Memorial is one of many alarming examples of this. In Belarus, we have seen how the regime has cynically exploited migrants for political objectives. Belarus must release all political prisoners and hold democratic elections. As chair, Sweden also worked to ensure that Russia's aggression against Ukraine and Russia's illegal annexation of Crimea have remained high on the OSCE agenda. Eight years will have soon passed since the situation arose and more than 14,000 people have lost their lives. But the, time, the passing of time does not make these violations of international law any more acceptable. We now must carry on this work as member of the OSCE Troika. Mr Speaker, we are living in the midst of an accelerating climate and environmental crisis. Sweden will take the lead in the climate transition. However, the global level of ambition is far from adequate. Climate change and environmental degradation contribute to increased tensions and conflicts. The climate is of critical importance to our security. We must take climate-related security threats extremely seriously. During our term as chair, the OSCE took a decision to address the challenges brought about by climate change. And thanks to Sweden's uh, strong role, the OSCE now has a mandate to take preventive action against the effects of climate change on security in the region. We will appoint an ambassador for climate and security. We will incorporate new expertise into our international crisis management operations, peace building, international development cooperation, and also climate diplomacy. We will continue to strengthen the Swedish initiated UN mechanism for climate and security. In just a few years, this mechanism has become a mainstay in countries and regions affected by climate related conflicts. In June, Sweden will host Stockholm Plus 50. This is an international UN meeting which is aimed at advancing an equitable and global green transition. Mr Speaker, the COVID-19 pandemic has hindered the implementation of the 2030 Agenda. And the global progress of recent years, such as improvements in maternal and child health and gender equality, have been undone to some extent. It's the first time in 20 years that global hunger and extreme poverty have increased. The 2030 Agenda is our roadmap for reversing this trend. Mr Speaker, the need for a better global health system and the realisation that the pandemic's consequences have hit women and children the hardest, these have been painful lessons. The government pursued the issue of a more equitable, equitable COVID-19 vaccine distribution from an early stage. The COVAX Global Vaccine Initiative has now delivered 1 billion vaccine doses to 144 countries around the world. Sweden is the world's largest per capita donor to COVAX and the fifth largest donor overall. Efforts to strengthen global health security, not least efforts uh, to combat antibiotic resistance and to develop a robust new global pandemic treaty are a priority. The government will therefore appoint an ambassador at the Ministry of Health, of, of health and Social Affairs to work on global health security. Mr Speaker, the EU is Sweden's most important foreign and security policy arena. In uncertain times, the member states stand stronger together. We will continue to strengthen our close ties with our partners within the EU and with our Nordic and Baltic neighbours. Efforts to realise the vision of the Nordic region as the most, world's most sustainable, integrated and digitally advanced region will be intensified. The government wants to see a strong EU that can take greater responsibility for its own security, but we also stress at the same time that this is not incompatible with an openness to vis-à-vis -vis developing partnerships or even a strong transatlantic link. Next year, Sweden will hold the presidency of the Council of the European Union for the third time. The Minister for EU Affairs recently outlined how our work, how work on the government's priorities will be pursued at the EU level. It is an ambitious agenda. The situation uh, of refugees and migrants demands our continued attention. The EU must establish a common asylum system that provides legal certainty and is humane and sustainable where everyone takes their share of the responsibility. We continue to work close, closely with United, the United Kingdom, not, 
least on security and defense policy, trade, and also education and research. The United States is once again a constructive partner in the global arena. This is encouraging for continued and enhanced cooperation, not least in the areas of climate change, democracy and gender equality. Cooperation with the US is central to security and defence policy, trade and also technology. Mr Speaker, feminist foreign policy continues to grow. Sweden was first and it is gratifying to see that Germany is now following suit, like Canada, France, Luxembourg, Spain and Mexico, who are also pursuing feminist foreign policies. Our efforts must be intensified, not least given the backlash against gender equality that we have seen in the wake of the pandemic. Violence against women and girls has increased all over the world. The pandemic, the climate crisis and shrinking demo democratic space are putting us at risk of a global gender equality recession. Feminist foreign policy is needed more than ever. In 2022, we will be producing a new national action plan for women, peace and security, as well as a new global strategy for gender equality in aid. In UN Generation Equality Forum, Sweden is leading the action for women's economic empowerment. Mr. Speaker. For the for the fifth consecutive year, we are now seeing more countries moving in an authoritarian direction compared to those that are moving in a democratic direction. Military coups in Myanmar, Sudan, Mali, Burkina Faso, the Taliban takeover in Afghanistan, a deterioration in the situation of Belarus and a conflict in Ethiopia are dramatic examples of uh, the democratic backsliding. At the Summit for Democracy, Democracy hosted by the US President Joe Biden, Sweden was an active part partner in several activities in which both the Prime Minister and I took part. The Swedish message was the rise of right-wing populism and nationalism undermines democracy and human rights, the rule of law and women's political and economic participation. These are crucial for democracy. LGBTQ people's rights must be fully respected internationally. This year, Sweden holds the presidency of the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, where we will continue to promote Holocaust remembrance and do our utmost to combat anti-Semitism and anti-Gypsism. More attention must be directed towards the lack of democracy and human rights in working life globally. Workers are harassed, lose their jobs and are even killed for their trade union activities. The Ministry for Foreign Affairs will continue its efforts in these areas, including within the Global Deal. Mr. Speaker, the nuclear weapons threat is a reality and we must continue our disarmament efforts. The aim is a world free of nuclear weapons. Within the framework of the so-called Stockholm Initiative, we have proposed 22 specific steps that provide a constructive and pragmatic approach to nuclear disarmament. An increasing number of countries now back Sweden's proposal. We have actively turned to the five nuclear weapon states. Gratifyingly, the Stockholm Initiative's message on the need for progress has been heard. On January 3rd, the five affirmed in a joint statement that, for example, uh, a nuclear war cannot be won and must never be fought. That was the end of the quote. Mr. Speaker. Humanitarian needs in the world are increasing dramatically. Inequalities are growing. Almost 275 million people are in need of humanitarian aid in order to survive. Some 45 million women, men and children in 43 countries are on the brink of starvation. Sweden's aid policy will maintain a high level of ambition in terms of both scale and quality. Sweden's official development assistance will continue to be equivalent to 1% of the gross national income. And Swedish aid is to be used to reduce poverty and injustice, injustice around the world. It is a matter of solidarity and also the conviction that a better world makes for a more secure Sweden. Sweden will step up its efforts to prevent climate change and its effects on food security and the environment and promote sustainable living conditions. In 2022, we will increase climate aid by an additional 
1 billion kroner. When anti-democratic forces gain ground, Sweden's aid will be an unwavering uh, counterweight. More democratic societies make the world a better place and increase security in Sweden. Mr. Speaker, I was the first Swedish Minister for Foreign Affairs to visit Israel for 10 years. It is important that the government has improved our relations, and at the same time we continue to recognize Palestine's and uh, with the, the basis in international law, Sweden continues to act for a two-state solution. In Mali, we have seen terrorist groups increasing their activities and that the junta has postponed the democratic elections and engaged in cooperation with Russian mercenaries. That is not to be accepted. Sweden's military and civilian engagement in Mali aims to promote security, counteract terrorism and build sustainable development with respect for human rights. The war in Yemen is now in its eighth year. It is one of the world's greatest humanitarian disasters. Sweden will continue to emphasize the need for peace uh, uh, talks to the UN. The inclusion of women in these talks is a prerequisite for lasting peace. Syria is a deeply ravaged country. The conflict is now in its 12th year. Millions of people are living in acute humanitarian need. Sweden is and will remain to be one of the largest humanitarian donors. The conflict and the humanitarian crisis in Ethiopia undermine stability through the Horn of Africa. Ethiopia is headed towards a, a famine. Thousands have been killed in the conflict, including 24 UN aid workers. We will continue to work through the EU and the UN for an immediate ceasefire. Mr. Speaker, as the Prime Minister has said, Quote, we will leave no stone unturned to break segregation and crack down on gangs. End of quote. The underlying criminal structures are almost always transnational. The digital transformation of our societies brings an increase in international cybercrime. Shootings and explosions, often using smuggled weapons, remain in a considerable security challenge. Far too often, these young men are in, that are involved are tools used by more heavyweight international criminal actors. A year and a half ago, I appointed a special envoy on organized crime to identify with the Swedish Foreign Service to look at how we can better support law enforcement authorities. A number of embassies have received special assignments to fight organized crimes, and in the next stage, several embassies will be equipped in such a way that they can better contribute to crime prevention. Cooperation between law enforcement agencies and embassies will be strengthened. Mr. Speaker. We must stand up for free trade, particularly at a time when the winds of protectionism are blowing stronger. The multilateral trade system based on the World Trade Organization is fundamental to growth and welfare. A threat to the rules-based trade system is a threat to the Swedish economy and our trade negotiation relations. And at the same time as collaboration is important, we act uh, against any security threatening activity directed at Sweden and Swedish companies. Sweden and the EU need to work even more closely with like-minded partners to safeguard and develop global trade, focusing on the green transition to a fossil-free society. Our trade policy is to contribute to achieving the goals of the Paris Agreement and the 2030 Agenda. Through Sweden's participation in Expo 2020, we are showcasing how Swedish solutions can enable the transition in a green and sustainable direction. China's international significance also affects the Sweden and Swedish interests, not least in trade. We engage in a frank and open dialogue with China about human rights and freedom of expression. Sweden and the EU see global challenges that we can only address together with the China, such as climate, health and a functioning and fair free trade order. Mr. Speaker, last year Sweden evacuated around 2,000 individuals from Afghanistan. In August, the situation at the Kabul area airport was at times chaotic and very, very difficult. Swedish Armed Forces personnel were just seconds away when a bomb exploded close to the airport.
And on behalf of the government, I would like to reiterate our thanks to everyone in the Swedish Foreign Service, government agencies and municipalities who worked day and night on the evacuations. I'm proud of the collective operation that Sweden implemented. Despite the grave sense of global darkness that many are undoubtedly feeling right now, and although the need for our joint efforts may seem never-ending, I would like to conclude by saying that there is hope that through hard work and clear lines, uh, change is possible. Or, as Archbishop Desmond Tutu said, hope is being able to see that there is light despite of all the darkness. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And uh, the following have asked for rejoinders. Hans Wallmann from the Moderate Party, Oren Simelen, uh, Swedish Democrats, Kerstin Lundgren, Håkan Svendeling, Lars Adaktusson, Johan Forsell and uh, Maria Färm. And uh, we begin with Hans Wallmark from the Moderate Party, please. Mr. Speaker, there's a sheet of information saying that we are to use uh, alcohol gel before and after uh, addressing anyone from here. I see that the Minister for Foreign Affairs is doing the same. Mr. Speaker, the government is to seek guidance and advice from the government, and we need a government today who can work with both hands. We need to upgrade our defense, armed forces, and that is something which is urgent, but also because we expect Russia to be a threat to peace in Europe over a, a long time ahead. We need to upgrade our security policy with a non-alignment or non-participation in military alliances with no particular purpose. This dangerous opposition has driven the government before it, not least when it comes to defense matters and defense commissions. I have a number of questions. The Defence Commission will resume its work this afternoon, in fact. Are the Social Democrats prepared to also contribute to ensuring that more new money is allocated, or do you only intend to have redistributions within the armed forces? Because surely the Minister for Foreign Affairs shares the view that it's important that we take action here and now. And then secondly, is the government prepared to review the security policy uh, analysis, given the very serious challenge we're now seeing in Europe, a threat to our security order in Europe, provided uh, the Russian actions uh, are what they are. Are you prepared to also investigate whether there is uh, defense equipment perhaps available which could be uh, sent to Ukraine? if available. And fourthly, do you intend in any way seriously initiate a, a discussion with the five parties that constitute a majority in the Swedish parliament on the idea of a Swedish NATO option? This, Mr. Speaker, would be a set of questions that I would like to see answers uh, to. Thank you. Anne Linne, Minister of Foreign Affairs, you have the floor. Thanks, Mikael Talman. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you also to Hans Wallmark for these uh, questions. Well, the Defence Commission, just like you say, they're going to meet today and they are then going to discuss uh, these issues and we'll see what they conclude. And when it comes to the security policy analysis, let me remind you that uh, we have uh, taken note of uh, what is happening, and that is in the defence uh, um, proposition that has uh, been uh, submitted. So this is something that has been taken into consideration. And when it comes to given tasks, When it comes to delivering military supplies to Ukraine, well, partly we can help Ukraine in many different ways. And there are many countries who do not give much aid helping Ukraine with their resilience uh, in their society. And that is what we do. We have about one billion that we give every year to Ukraine. And uh, then we have the US, uh, the UK and uh, Switzerland. And together with them, we have a fund where we give 50 million and then the other countries contribute as well. And we also provide humanitarian aid. And when it comes to possible Swedish aid, well, we have to look at the different things, what the defense forces have themselves. And uh, here we have 
only to look at countries around us to understand that this is a complicated issue. It's not uh, that we cannot just hand over to Ukraine uh, materials that we do not need ourselves. We have seen examples of that happening. And when it comes to military equipment, well, we have to go through the normal ESP. There is no ban when it comes to weapons exported to Ukraine, but we have to go through the normal routes. And then... I'll, well, I'll get back a few more questions. Thank you, Talman. Yeah, there was a question. Thank you. There was indeed one more question. It's the matter of a Swedish NATO option, so it's not a small one by any manner means. We look forward to that. The fact that we've chosen blue and yellow today, it's also in, in honour not just of Sweden, but in Ukraine. There's a day of unity declared in Ukraine today. I think it's very important that Sweden supports Ukraine in many different ways. I have no objections to what the minister just outlined, but I think it could be worth to complement this with a proposal from my party and others could be if we could look into whether there would be supplies that we could spare without... An, uh, jeopardizing in any way or the Swedish defense. I'd like to complement the set of questions I raised earlier with the following. The Russian ambassador spoke very threateningly in, uh, to the Swedish newspaper Aftonbladet, and he said from a Russian perspective, basically, that it is not possible for Sweden and Finland to become members of NATO. It's incredibly important that we're very clear in responding to this, both with Swedish and Kyrillic uh, letters, in fact, that we do not accept such threats uh, pronounced against our country. Foreign Minister? <coughs> Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. When it uh, comes to the NATO option, well, we do not uh, think that uh, this will make any difference whatsoever. The opposite is the case. If we are to start to begin to change our security policy line towards Finland, for example, where they do not have NATO option in any written text in Finland, well, then we would start lots of speculations and there would be question marks about our security policy and where it's headed. And I think that would be detrimental to Sweden from a security perspective and also when it comes to our possibilities to keep Sweden in this peaceful, relaxed situation and that is why we do not want that we want stability overall and when it comes to standing up for ukraine well i totally share your ambition hans valmark compared to other countries well we have been fighting for ukraine since the 90s i've been there uh, three times only last one year and a half thank you thank you that concludes that set of rejoinders and we continue with aron erimson from the sweden democrats please Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Ukraine, as we all know, has a number of dramatic days ahead of it. The Russian bear roaring in every uh, geographic direction, it appears. And how does one assess whether it is possible to uh, oppose the Russian war machinery? The situation remains very difficult for Ukraine. The minister responded to uh, uh, a comment on arms exports, stating that our rules are very strict, so this is not something which is on the cards for us. But the statement also gives uh, the impression that it is currently not possible to export arms and, and uh, defense materials uh, and supplies to Ukraine. Now we heard that it is possible, but it has to be done through the regular channels. So here's an interpretation of the rules which needs to be clarified. Because the current rules underlines the holistic uh, assessment required with a number of factors considered, the democratic status of the recipient country, the interests of Sweden, and it should only be possible to export to Ukraine if there are any sanctions against Ukraine, and there are no, no such sanctions in place, of course. Several countries have shouldered a great responsibility uh, around us in our part of the world. The UK, Denmark have declared that they're open to do this as well. And so uh, I wonder why is it currently impossible for Sweden to do the same thing based on our current set of rules and provisions? And I align myself with Mr. Valman's question. Are you prepared to give the armed forces and the uh, 
defence uh, supplies uh, industry uh, the task of uh, verifying if it would be possible to provide any additional supplies to Ukraine, because that is what is asked for and needed. Thank you, Madam Minister. Norman. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, I'm not sure what words to use. Uh, the Sweden Democrats, uh, well, uh, I have to tell you that yesterday uh, the e European Parliament voted about, well, giving assistance to the Ukraine, and all Swedish parliamentarians voted in favour of that financial aid, with the exception of three parliamentarians uh, from the Sweden Democrats, as you voted no also to the association agreement with Ukraine, and you have links to Russia, and the Sweden Democrats cannot choose uh, between Macron and Putin. And then you're talking about you, the Sweden Democrats, being the best friend of Ukraine. That's hypocrisy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm not sure uh, where I should begin, because this is baffling. The Sweden Democrats has a stable uh, um, history of uh, a track record when it comes to Russia. I've looked at this more in depth because I've seen the Social Democratic and Centre Party information previously, and it was worth looking at. It's very important to be careful with uh, your sources and to be critical. We voted to use the peace facility of the EU uh, rather than uh, pointless military support uh, to Ukraine. We have supported a very large part of the support proposed for Ukraine over a number of years. Now, the MEPs may need to sometimes uh, uh, not vote in favour of a proposal when there are uh, problems linked, for example, to uh, the uh, economy in Ukraine to be considered. But there are very strict sanctions proposed. We believe uh, that the government should be clear. And we've been very clear to discuss in the parliament to uh, require a debate on these issues. Thank you very much. Uh, Anne Linde. Well, I can only refer to what happened yesterday in the European Parliament, and that tells us what the Sweden Democrat view is. The financial aid that is given to Ukraine, it's a strong, it's one of the biggest ones in the world. And then when it comes to the rules about Swedish arms exports, I have to repeat that there is no ban when it comes to exporting weapons to Ukraine, but it has to go through the normal rules that are there for exporting products. And that is something that has been voted on in Parliament. Thank you. And then we conclude that set of rejoinders and we continue with the next. Kerstin Lundgren from the Centre Party, please. Thank you, Talman. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Well, of course, there are some elements in the uh, statement of the policy that we agree with when it comes to foreign policy, equality, releasing political prisoners, etc. However, Madam Speaker, I read the 2002 Statement of Government Policy to say that Sweden has a non-participation in military alliances and the agreements made on the political position in security issues in Sweden uh, stands. And we continue our reform of the total defence in Sweden. And in 2014, the Swedish non-participation in military alliances still serves our country well, I read, laying a good foundation for active uh, sense of responsibility for our own and other security, Sweden will not apply for membership in NATO. Where was the agreement from 2002? And where do we find the agreement from 2002 or any new agreement to replace the previous ones? Uh, in the uh, statement of government policy on foreign affairs um, that we can now read, I would be very interested to get that information from um, Anne Linde. Russia today is threatening an independent sovereign country, Ukraine, by way of military might, in breach of the European security order in itself. That should lead to almost automatic requests for sanctions. Can we expect such demands for sanctions? And are we also prepared, in terms of military means and military equipment, support and defend Ukraine? Minister for Foreign Affairs and Linda of the Social Democratic Party. 
Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you, Justin Lundgren, for these uh, questions. When it comes to the security policy line of the last 20 years and before then as well, we have uh, said that uh, the military non-alignment uh, is something that should remain. It serves as well, but it should be combined with the strong defense and security that is to be built uh, together with others. We have uh, different collaborations and some 20 different agreements that are in place. And uh, this is uh, something that uh, the government wants to stick to. And when it comes to defense supplies to Ukraine, well, I have said this already. Uh, this is about many different things. Firstly, what we need ourselves for our own defense right now. We cannot just see if we can find something old that we do not need anymore that can be sent to Ukraine. Unfortunately, we have seen examples of that being done before. What we can do is to strengthen the resilience of Ukraine, and we do that in the best possible way, by helping with the financial aid, the biggest of them all, about one billion a year. And uh, that way we can build resilience through education, training, so that they can withstand cyber attacks, uh, hybrid attacks, and also to strengthen reforms of uh, the Ukrainian financial system, which is something that I've also been asking for. And uh, comparing us to USA, Great Britain, Canada, well, what is different is that we stay there in this mission and we are there in spite of the serious situation. And it's a dangerous situation for these observers, but we have uh, had meetings. We have looked at uh, how we can contribute to that mission, and that is just as important. Thank you. Kerstin Lundgren, please. Allman. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I hear the Minister for Foreign Affairs say that the uh, charted course remains unchanged. But if you read in the declaration the statement from 2002, a social democratic government made the agreement. Anna Lind writes in her statement of foreign policy that this was an agreement entered into with the Conservative Party, the Moderates, the Christian Democrats and the Centre Party. And uh, it was referenced in the statement which I quoted from back then. And so the new elements added in the autumn of 2014, which agreement existed to uh, back that agreement up, that the inclusion of new elements, was there a broad agreement, was there a discussion or a dialogue, or was it a unilateral rewording? The minister needs to give us an answer. Thank you very much. Final rejoinder, uh, Minister for Foreign Affairs, Aninda. Thank you, Madam Speaker. We do not think that this is a new line. However, we can describe the military non-alignment in different ways and that it stays firm and that we've had it for many years, etc. That doesn't mean that it's being changed. It's linked to strong defense and also collaborations where we work together with others. And I do not think that we have made any changes whatsoever. And, uh, and then we continue with the next set of rejoinders and Håkan Svenneling from the left. Fru Talman. Madam Speaker, one of the issues not mentioned by uh, the minister was that the situation for democracy and for the opposition for several years uh, in have been deteriorating in Turkey under the uh, reign of President Erdogan. Currently, there are uh, cr criminal proceedings against 108 leading representatives of the opposition party, HDP, and the state... Uh, um, Prosecutor has initiated a process to dissolve the party. There are thousands of party members in prison for their political corruption and the rightful criticism by the rest of the world against the court proceedings against philanthropist and activist Osman Kavala almost made Erdogan expel the ambassadors of Sweden and other countries. And a number of Swedes have been uh, listed on the terrorist list by Turkey, entirely in breach of international convention. And only at the beginning of February, the Turkish military carried out airstrikes against Kurdish parts of northern Iraq and Syria. Bombs fell over civilian and refugee camps 
in a war-torn area where Kurdish groups had fought against the Turgut bias in a situation where social gaps are increasing exponentially because Erdogan has run the Turkish economy to the ground in order to favor a rich and powerful elite at the expense of regular ordinary Turks. Tur Turkey is an applicant country to the EU even if the negotiations are uh, struggling. They receive pre-accession accession aid. Also, uh, in addition, they get money through the shameful uh, refugee agreement between the UAE and Turkey. So they get money and political uh, um, benefits. So today, the left party are sharpening their position. We want not to see the uh, accession negotiations frozen, but interrupted if Turkey should dissolve HDP or convict leading representatives in the mass trials. We're prepared to act together with other parties in the government during the spring to enable this. What is the government's position? Can Turkey still be considered as a democracy? And does the minister uh, condemn the bombings by Turkey in Iraq and in Syria? Minister uh, for Foreign Affairs, Anlinde. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Håkan Svenning, for the question. And this is an issue that uh, we have discussed in the Riksdag on a number of occasions. And we have a joint view with regard to the fact that the negative developments in Turkey when it comes to human rights, uh, so democracy, rule of law, and in particular, also the situation of the oppositional, uh, opposition politi politicians, Kurdish politicians, HDP, and also female activists, and and are working against, um, and also the the oppression of religious minorities. We are, we do not believe that we should break off negotiations entirely with regard to EU membership because these have been ongoing for a long time and in fact they have been really real negotiations have been ongoing for many years which we could see in the recent council conclusions is that membership is not on the cards at the moment and we support that the government it, it, interesting to see how the how opinion, public opinion is changing in Turkey, where our sister parties are, in fact, uh, telling us and urging us not to com entirely break off and end these sort of possibilities for Turkey to become a member, uh, that it would be detrimental to them if it happened now. And now, as regards the this this uh, agreement with regard to refugees, we support it entirely. And I have said on a number of occasions that these four million migrants in Turkey, they are being well looked after by Turkey. I have spoken to the UNHCR uh, head a number of times, and in fact, they're faring better than in many other displaced persons in many other places, parts of the world. And... We can't just, on the one hand, say that Turkey look after them, take care of them, on the other hand, uh, not pay for them. Madam Speaker, for a long time, the left party has been working for a stricter line from Sweden towards Turkey. And at the initiative of us and the Liberal Party, we stopped the arms export uh, in a united action shortly after Anne Linde took up uh, her office. The government act... Um, correctly a lot of the time but there is a great element of eu uh, adaptation which weakens the swedish position you talked of a freezing of the uh, negotiations but there's money coming into the turkish accounts every month a potential dissolution of the opposition party hdp or condemning Sentencing leading HDP politicians, politicians in mass trials is a new situation with severe restrictions in the ever more shrinking democracy in Turkey. Then Sweden needs to act. I think it's time to be even sharper uh, in relation to Turkey, to bring pressure to bear on Erdogan so he doesn't shut down democracy entirely because we believe that there is a danger that this might happen. So I wonder if when the government intends to be stricter in relation to Turkey. Thank you. Final rejoinder by uh, Minister for Foreign Affairs and Linda from the Social Democratic Party. Um, yeah. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. Now, our Turkey policy is very forceful in our condemnation as regards military attacks, uh, human rights abuses, and also as regards the case of Oscar Vallas. Now, as regards the refugee agreement, let me just say, so there's no misunderstanding here, the money that the EU uh, is allocating, it doesn't go to Turkey, it goes to pay for health care, education, work for these four or five million refugees there, which otherwise 
would have come to the EU. And of course, it's reasonable for us to pay for them because they can't return to uh, war-torn Syria, because it's mainly Syrian refugees we're talking about. So there's a lot you can say about policies vis-à-vis -vis Turkey. It's important that we stand up for human rights, democracy, and the opposition's right to pursue politics in Turkey. That's the end of that round. Next, we have Lars Adoktusson from the Christian Democrats, please. Madam Speaker, the Russian aggression in our neighboring area poses very important questions regarding the security policy line chosen by the government. For the first time since the end of the World Wars, Moscow has stated that Sweden and Finland are considered as part of what is referred to as a Russian sphere of interest. What this might entail can be seen with frightening clarity in the interview with the uh, Russian ambassador to Sweden mentioned by Hans Wallmark uh, a few moments ago. According to the ambassador here in Stockholm, Sweden could not join NATO because Russia requires a stop, a halt to new members in the Western Defence Alliance. Madam Speaker, this is per se absurd and it lacks in good judgment. Does the ambassador not accept that Sweden's relations with NATO are to be determined by Sweden? If not, he should pack up his bags and return to Moscow in all fairness. Madam Speaker, an individual ambassador who fails to fully understand what national sovereignty means can, of course, be disregarded. In this case, it would be unwise. And then the bizarre approach expressed by him happens, in fact, to be shared by Putin and his councillors. Shamelessly, they claim that Sweden constitutes a part of a sphere of interest for Russia. What is Anne Linde's view? What is your stance on this? What does this say about Sweden's security policy approach? if such Russian confusions are even possible. Thank you, Madam Minister, Anne Linde. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Lars. I'd like to sum for your question. Now, naturally, Sweden makes its own decisions with regard to our security policy, and the Russian ambassador is, of course, fully aware of that. And there's no other view. The government has no different view. And naturally, also, we are constantly talking with the various ambassadors, even those who express views which are not correct in relation to the facts at hand. And that applies to and, and the ambassadors, they know this. And in Sweden, we determine our own security policy and none of the ambassadors can call that into question. Thank you, Madam Speaker. That's the end of the uh, this round. Or the final comment. Madam Speaker, if the Swedish line is as clear as the minister states, how is it that Russia can include Sweden in a Russian sphere of interest? Sweden, but not Norway or Denmark, because they happen to be members of NATO. That there is scope for Russia to include Sweden in its sphere of interest adds further uncertainty to the government's current security policy line. It doesn't even have support here in the Swedish parliament. The Riksdag, through a NATO option, a clear majority would like to clarify the Swedish approach. The government has chosen to ignore this, and it is irresponsible. In particular, Anne Linde, when we are in the most serious security policy crisis we've seen for decades. Thank you. Final rejoinder by the Minister for Foreign Affairs. Direct. Thank you, Madam Speaker. It would be entirely irresponsible to change our security policy now, just like Finland. We safeguard stability, we safeguard predictability, and we also safeguard the matter, the question that everyone should know what we are doing, what we're saying, that we agree with Finland on this, Finland's government. And as you know, we have a very close cooperation with Finland. 
They have had their NATO option for the last 25 years. They will keep that. We have our way of expressing ourselves. It's stability, it's predictability, and it's the possibility for everyone to know our policy, what policy we have, and Finland, what they have. That is a responsible security policy. Thank you. Thank you. That's the end of that round of rejoinders. Next, you are Foschel from the Liberal Party, please. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for the Statement of Government Policy in Foreign Affairs. I have two questions, in fact. The first one has to do with support and aid to Ukraine. From a Liberal Party perspective, we uh, share interest with uh, Ukraine. The threat of Russian aggression against Ukraine is an aggression against all the countries included in the European security order. Threatening Ukraine is also threatening Sweden. The way we interpret legislation, it should be possible to export weapons, arms to Ukraine. It would be a good idea if Ukraine would like to receive them, simply because uh, their interests uh, are in line with the Swedish security and foreign policy to defend this European security order. And so my first question is whether the minister would be prepared to try this, to uh, make an assessment. We've heard that there are uncertainties as to whether this would be possible should Ukraine request this type of supplies. But the question is also whether this, uh, there's an interest in assessing the matter. And my second question has to do with China and Taiwan. Taiwan wasn't mentioned at all. China was mentioned with uh, one line or very sparingly, considering that it is the most dangerous dictatorship in the sense that they commit violations of uh, international uh, against international law and they agitate against the rest of the world. And on a regular basis, China flies uh, military aircraft across the airspace uh, uh, of Ukraine, says the speaker, on a regular basis against Taiwan, rather, the speaker corrects himself. And my question is whether uh, uh, the government condemns the provocations uh, from China with these uh, aircraft flying over. Thank you. And Linda. Thank you, Talman. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Yes, thank you, Joa Forshell, for your question as well. Now, as regards Swedish support of mil uh, military equipment, we sometimes need to, or we do need to look at the regulations that we have when it comes to export controls of weapons. And we know this, and the RICSA, we know this, that we have broad support for this. And the testing these issues, uh, it lies with the authority, the ISP, because we haven't exported any uh, of this type of equipment to Ukraine in modern times. But this doesn't mean that I'm saying that there is an absolute ban when it comes to Ukraine, but Sweden is not applying a system to approve or not approve recipient countries in advance. So if there's no ban on exports in the shape of a weapons embargo internationally, each export must be, that must be then looked at on a case-by-case -case basis, and this is done by ISP, and that's what applies when it comes to the export of weapons. And let me also say that the armed forces also have their views with regard to this as we are building up our own capabilities as we speak, which is why I do believe that we need to continue with our exceptional form of support to Ukraine. We have, in fact, given them support to uh, their defense with uh, training, and we participate in different ways to try to reinforce the defense sector there and also to strengthen their <clears throat> ability to uh, fight back. I think that is the best way for us to deal with this in the here and now. Taiwan, I'll have to take in the next round. Sorry. Thank you. You are for Shell. 
Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you uh, to the Minister for this reply. I'd like to clarify that the Liberal Party uh, believes, of course, that all investments to strengthen our de defence and our armed forces is a positive step, but defending Ukraine is also a way of defending Sweden, because you defend the European security order in this way. And so to us, we believe that it should be possible to export arms to Ukraine. I uh, understand the technical objections raised by the minister, but it would be good, it would be a positive step to uh, have a statement in f support of such a development, should Ukraine wish to receive them. And then on to Taiwan. And what I tried to say earlier is, of course, that China on a regular basis flies over Taiwan territory acting very aggressively, uh, trying to provoke them and restrict Taiwan's right to uh, self-determination and self-control of their own territory. Does the government uh, condemn the aggressions by China against Taiwan? Thank you. Final rejoinder uh, for the minister. <coughs> Thank you, Madam Speaker. It is very unfortunate that China is trying to limit Taiwan's room for manoeuvre. And our point of departure for the government is that we need to work as broadly as, as, as possible and supporting Taiwan, both as regards, uh, or, I mean, our interests and the EU's interests. And we are we try to get Taiwan to uh, participate in international organizations and so on. Just like with other EU member states, Sweden supports the One China policy. So there is no policy, uh, possibility of recognizing Taiwan in that way. That's the end of that round of rejoinders. Next, we have Maria Farm from the Green Party, please. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Today, a great deal of uh, the, this debate will focus on the serious uh, current uh, security policy situation. I'm going to touch upon this, uh, of course, in my address. But I do have a question already at this stage to the Minister. It's a question which I put to her in writing a few weeks ago as well the matter of the sudden terror classification of six uh, civil society organizations in Palestine. They've been criticized by, they, this has been criticized by Human Rights Watch and the UN and Amnesty International. When the minister responded, the minister has previously stated in that response that the government will follow up the issue of what information uh, underpinned this decision and Sweden did not receive any uh, prior information about this decision. So I wonder about the type of follow up that has been uh, made so far. Have, are you monitoring this situation? Could the minister tell us uh, more about the ever shrinking uh, role and uh, space available for NGOs in Palestine? Thank you, Minister. Thank for Talman. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you, Maria Firm, for your question. Now, as regards these terrorist classed, classified organizations where Sweden and uh, many member states are working together, we have, in fact, requested information from Israel about the basis for this, and we haven't received an answer to that as yet which means that we will continue to continue with these organizations. And it's the same policy that other EU member states have. So if there is a terrorist classification, we need to know why uh, that is. We can't just accept that and, you know, that somebody just says that without giving any proof at the same time. We are also very clear uh, and underlined our right to security. We also say that the, that the Palestinians, they have the right also to work in uh, civilian organizations, that there's the right to mobility against the settler policies, what's happening in Sheikh Garai, for example, in eastern Jerusalem. 
is actually completely unacceptable that these people are being forced to leave their homes in this way. And we do know that in the Israeli government, the foreign minister ha and their, his party, has they have in fact condemned the violence that we see from the part of the settlers. And we support international law in all situations. Thank you. The final rejoinder from Maria Fern, please. Madam Speaker, thank you, Madam Minister, for this reply. It's uh, worrying to hear that there's been no uh, explanation forthcoming from Israel so far. But it's important to know that the stance by Sweden and others is to continue to work with these organizations because there are major risks if organizations working to promote human rights in Palestine and in Israel are, uh, end up in an ever more difficult situation. As the minister states, this is only one of several factors that have been worrying during the autumn and the winter. We also have, for example, a proposal for more illegal settlements uh, with uh, more people being evicted and Israel and Palestine are uh, moving further uh, and further away from a two-state solution, as far as uh, we can see. So I wonder if the minister could tell us a bit more, perhaps, about uh, the work of the government to try and counteract these actions by Israel. Thank you. Final rejoinder by the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Anina. Tolman. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Naturally, the aim for of our work is to have a two-state solution based on international law, and I can only say here and now that with the new government there, there has in fact been high level ministerial meetings between the Israeli government and ministers in the uh, from the Palestinian side. And so what we can do is to see here, is there any way we can support a two state solution? And I do hope that with our new relations with Israel, that we perhaps will be able to contribute in the best possible way. However, naturally, we will be continuing to oppose the settler policy uh, and so on. This, is, this isn't going to be changed, which, I mean, because it's very positive that we do have a new, uh, that we have new, better, improved relations with Israel. Thank you. That's the end of that round of rejoinders. And next, we go back to the speaker. And we have Hans Wallmark from the Moderate Party, please. Madam Speaker, this is a, we have a very difficult security security police uh, at the moment, but it's always about people and individuals, and the clock is ticking. Ten seconds. It's a painfully long silence here in the Riksdag. But for 647 million seconds, 20 and a half years, David Isaac has been imprisoned in Eritrea. The Swedish publisher Gui Minhai has been robbed of his freedom. The Alexei Navalny in Russia or others who are protesting and demanding democracy and decency in Belarus and Myanmar. 10 seconds. What is 10 seconds to all those days, weeks and years? Maxwell was 56 when he was murdered in Moscow. Oscar was 48. These are dark times. And the unfair election in Belarus, annexation of Crimea, and now the massive Russian influx of troops around Ukraine as well. The clock is ticking. Almost a decade of gesture politics. When reality is rearing its ugly head, again, you need action and the gathering of forces, a gathering where we will be, there will be if genuine action is taken. Madam... Speaker, we see Russia advancing its positions and setting ultimatums, annexation, talk of reconquering, demands on Western Europe, buffer zones and spheres of interest, threats that countries may not make their own security policy decisions themselves, like, for example, membership of NATO, and a break, total break from 
the secure, European security orders. Last year, quite a lot of seconds ago, I said at the foreign policy debate that Russia, through its action in this part of the world, has a is a destroyer, that, and it's a security risk, Nord Stream 2, and that sanctions against the project should be, in fact, part of Sweden's arsenal. This particular project must be included in the package of sanctions that the EU is now preparing against Russia. But it's not always all about China. We also see China as a challenge. Dusk has fallen over Hong Kong. The Yogos in Xinjiang, the threat against Taiwan. It, there's a coordination between Moscow and Beijing. And can the West have a presence at the same time in both Europe and the South China Sea and the Pacific? In the Indian Ocean, Iran is, has naval exercise together with China and Russia with the Revolutionary Guard itself as a participant. The president of Iran wishes to deepen, and deepen economic cooperation with Russia and China. Iran is looking for new markets to circumvent the sanctions and to continue destabilizing the situation in the Middle East. The front lines of the global security policy are now at Ukraine, the Taiwan Straits, but also uh, also Israel, threatened and hated by, hated by Iran. Madam Speaker, during last year's debate, the foreign minister said, let me quote, with our clear security policy, our fair development aid, our climate and environmental investments, our feminist foreign policy and a strong trade policy, we can safeguard not just our own country, but we can contribute to peace, security, development and democracy globally, end of quote. Does the foreign minister believe that the, foreign, the policy that has been pursued has made the world a safer place? Is Sweden a safer place today than it was in 2040 or even to 2021 during the presidency of the OSCE? Unfortunately, the government's policy is least sure when it is needed most. Our neighbours, Norway and Denmark, have the social democrats at the helm and have pushed for NATO membership. Let Denmark act as a good example. Their foreign policy has now been changed due to the deteriorated situation. What Sweden needs is a realistic security policy. That is what we, the moderate party, have to offer with a new government. A policy that does not put the party at the centre of things, but that ensures that Sweden's interests are at the core. When a broad Riksdag majority in 2020, December 2020, supported the idea of expressing a Swedish NATO option, the Social Democrats said no. The government has a legal possibility to duck. It is true. But with what legitimacy? with only 100 seats in the parliament, the Swedish people and all foreign embassies who are listening. Where the government sees a closed door, we say, we others, we say that the key lies in our own hands and that is how it shall remain. Another party's demand that the Defence Committee is convened uh, uh, due to the current situation. The decision lingers for a few weeks. Today, the committee, however, shall meet for the first time. But when some express a wish for a security policy analysis of the difficult and severe situation with Russia's acts and how that affects us, the Social Democrats say no. And when demands are put forward for action here and now to reinforce Swedish security, the Social Democrats say no. No to new resources. Instead, there is a redistribution between different budget years, but without an account of the consequences and what it actually entails in the shape of cutbacks going forward. Without new funding, a a planned regiment may be disbanded or several military equipment projects like new Navy vessels will be put on hold. Action and the gathering of forces is a strength that we as a country can show unity in difficult times, but that requires that the government can show that it takes action. Madam Speaker, let us look at three areas where the clock really is ticking and every second is invaluable. The security situation in Ukraine, there must be a clear message and it is self-evident that Sweden stands ready to help when a European democracy is threatened by Russian aggression. If Russia massively attacks Ukraine on a mass front, then it is an independent democratic nation that has been attacked and thus the whole of Europe and the security order that has been in place for decades. Sweden must stand up for, the, for Ukraine. The moderate party believes that we must consider the possibility to lend support in the shape of military equipment, including defensive weapons. The government must therefore, without further ado, give the defence authorities, the armed forces, uh, uh, give the assignment, the, the, that they're given the uh, assignment to make a rapid analysis of what Sweden can contribute with. And the question about what can be spared and how this should be done, this requires political will. It's also about giving support against extensive cyber attacks. A stronger Nordic-Baltic cooperation is not only what separates us that needs to be emphasised, but also that which unites us. In her declaration of government, the Prime Minister Magdalena has said that Nordic-Baltic cooperation shall be deepened. So this is the case. An important basis for Sweden's ability to have an impact on the development of the EU is 
our ability to form coalitions with like-minded nations. If the Nordics are our siblings and the three Baltic states are our family's closest cousins. Sweden's a place at all relevant meeting tables. Sweden as a country wishes to sit at the UN table, the table of the European Council of Ministers, the Nordic Council, the Nordic Council of Ministers. We want to wish to sit at the OSCE table, the Arctic Council table, the WHO, the WTO, but the Social Democrats do not wish to sit at the table that determines our security in Sweden, i.e. NATO's table. This is not consistent. And it goes against our Swedish identity of being internationalists. We want to join in and take responsibility, not take a step back and retreat, as Swedes. Now, eight years have been spent setting the interests of the social democracy in our foreign policy at the heart of things. We want to play Swedish interests at the core. It is times like these that define us as a country, as, a, as citizens. Now judgment will be passed. Madam Speaker, my time, speaking time is up, but the time for action has come. Thank you. The following have requested, or the following has requested uh, a rejoinder. That's Håkan Svedling, please. Ingenting från. Det lyser, det syns inte hos mig. Då tror jag att vi ska starta med utrikesminister. Let us start with Anne Linde, the foreign minister, who has requested a rejoinder. The speaker said she couldn't see the light. Wow! Not we can be glad and over them all together. Utan att vara nationalistiska. Absolut. We can agree on that without being too nationalistic, says the speakers. No, Anne Linde, please. Well, I and Hans and Valmark share the conclusion that what we see today is unacceptable, this Russian aggression towards Ukraine. And we also agree that we need to be strong in the EU when it comes to support to Ukraine. But here we have the Sweden Democrats. And as I've said before, as late as yesterday, they voted no with the MEPs in the European Parliament when it comes to financial aid to Ukraine. And they've also voted no to the association agreement between the EU and Ukraine. And they also have several links to Russia. And we know that the Sweden Democrats cannot choose between Macron and Putin. And even if the Sweden Democrats now try to adapt to fit into the right wing bloc where they have changed their policy when it comes to, for example, profits from the welfare sector. Well, fact remains that the NATO option, well, it doesn't mean that everyone in that group wants to belong uh, to NATO. The Sweden Democrats do not want to belong to NATO. And that is another sign showing how unclear you are in what you say. So a question for the moderate party. It looks like uh, the Sweden Democrats uh, will be the biggest or second biggest uh, party in this right wing bloc. And how does the moderate party imagine uh, the collaboration, not least when it comes to security policy. Thank you. Hans Valmark, please. Thank you, Madam Speaker. That It took one hour and 13 minutes before we started throwing words about, about the place, about the right-wing block. Now, let us lift the debate, actually, and not use that debating technique and actually discuss the issue at hand or issues at hand because I actually share your points of view. And I also aimed, actually, and the Sweden Democrats representatives here can get prepared for this because I was going to ask questions about what's happening, what happened in the European Parliament yesterday and also urged the foreign minister to do that. Uh, each party can answer questions for its own party. My party and the foreign minister's party our members, we voted in favour of this package for Ukraine. It's important. But let us listen to the Sweden Democrat version in the round of rejoinders there between the foreign minister and the Sweden Democrats. It's a relevant question and it should be asked to the party that's responsible for it. Just as I, it's reasonable that I ask questions to the left party uh, and not ask questions of the foreign minister to the left party. 
and it's just as the foreign minister says, the Sweden Democrats are one of five parties about have their views, different views on uh, the NATO show option. They're against the NATO membership, just like the Social Democrats, in fact. So what anxiety do you feel when it comes to the Sweden Democrats, when it comes to being against NATO membership? Thank you. That's the, the, the final rejoinder from the Foreign Minister, please. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I think this is fun, as a matter of fact, when we hear this, that right-wing conservative seems to be bad language that is being expressed. But that was not part of my question. My question was how you imagine that you should be able to govern her together when you have such a divergent view, you and the Sweden Democrats, when it comes to Swedish security policy. That was what I asked you. I'm fully prepared to ask questions to the Sweden Democrats, but this is a question for you. How will you be able to agree with the, the Sweden Democrats if they will be the second biggest or biggest party in a possible coalition government? How will you be able to have a, a security policy that is predictable and not negative? For Sweden. Thank you. And the final rejoinder, Hans Wallmark. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Now, I'm quite convinced that the Foreign Minister did not use high, a right-wing block to, you know, as a, a nice, in a nice way. I'm convinced that the, she had a different aim. And that's what I'm saying. Let's avoid this, even this, de or also this debate, actually ending up in that kind of discussion or that level. Now, as regards the issues at hand, as I've already said, I share the foreign minister's view with regard to the need that the European Parliament support the package to Ukraine. And I'm also pretty convinced that if there's a change of government, we will be able to have a fully uh, workable po foreign policy within the NATO Council. I'll also put questions to the left party later in this debate about how their policies whether it's compatible uh, being part of the government of the Social Democrats. But I'll save that for um, the left party and not say take that up with the foreign minister. That's the end of that round of rejoinders. Next, we have Håkan Svenning from the left party, please. Yes. Madam Speaker, it is difficult to find someone who is more of a proponent towards NATO here than Hans Wallmark. He expresses this wish to join NATO every day, but he's also writing about this NATO option. And we see that he really wants to fulfill this wet dream because we have the Defence Commission and the Defence Commission, including Hans Wallmark, were thinking about this for three years in the Commission. But then it only took this right-wing Conservative bloc one week to model this line through what you said about the NATO option. And that might have been a line that worked when there was no crisis. But now the security policy situation has changed and that there is a need in Sweden for standing united and being clear. And here we have a parliamentary majority for a NATO option. The second largest NATO country is Turkey. And this is a country where we see less and less democracy. It's a shrinking rapidly. And back then, you were proponents of a Turkish NATO membership, but today the moderate party feel that we should stop those negotiations. But you're still a friend of NATO. NATO has started more wars during the last decade. And at the same time, we have to realize that it is a nuclear organization and nuclear weapon that is the primary threat. And how do you feel about this today with the... Uh, membership for Turkey. Is it a problem? And when will you prioritize uh, the Swedish security and uh, put more importance on that than your dream to belong to NATO? It feels like you think that it can cost whatever it costs. We have to be members. And then we continue with uh, Hans Wallmark, please. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Now, I'm pretty sure that Håkan Svengeling, when he points out that I'm one of the 
biggest fans of NATO. I mean, you wanted to, uh, that was sort of uh, a nice thing to say, but I'm not quite sure that when he talks about the right wing bloc, uh, I'm not sure that that was the same thing. Uh, let us just lift this debate just a little bit. And I know that Hawke Asperling actually has that ability to do so. And then the question the, uh, here, the NATO option. Now, the Rick star, a long time ago, had in fact debated and discussed cooperation with Finland. And then there were motions and uh, uh, opinions with regard to NATO option. There were four parties in favor of that. We argued in favor. So it's not that it's sort of in this sort of a, it's just suddenly appeared out of nowhere. No, it's that the Sweden Democrats have broadened and deepened their policy. And they're taking position, just as I said to the foreign minister, they are strongly on the left party side and the social democrats and the green party side. They are against NATO membership. But they still have the ability to say that the other what the other and what the other NATO skeptical parties do in Finland and that is that we must make that decision ourselves. And I think that's a very important message. I have no problem with the fact that Sweden Democrats are against NATO or in favor of a NATO option. Uh, do you have a problem that the left party says that we shouldn't become members of NATO? And just as Hogan Svelling has said, Turkey is a multifaceted state. There is so much to be critical of. And, and I think that the round of rejoinders that you had with the foreign minister, that confirms that. But I can't say more than that with the three seconds that I have that remain. Next, Håkan Svelling from the left party for final rejoinder, please. Moderaterna försöker... Madam Hirsch Speaker, the moderates try to distinguish themselves by saying that they want to contribute to democracy and a more safe world, but uh, they have these ideological blinders. Uh, it is important and more important to prioritize NATO membership and more weapons purchases compared to democracy and increased security. And the problem with the NATO option is that it's unclear, it's so muddled, it's difficult for people to understand what this is, what the moderate party and the other parties want here in Parliament. And of course, we can start any collaborations. We do not have to have such an option saying that potentially in the future we're going to collaborate with another country or join whatever organization. And we cannot determine that this will always be our stance. But the problem with the NATO option is that you want to become members of NATO, and this is only one step on that route, but that creates insecurity in our Swedish security policy. Thank you. Hans Wallmark, please. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I didn't hear anything that might come later, but about NATO opposition and its sort of alliance, left part, the left party, the Sweden Democrats, the Green Party, Social Democrats, and how the left party are quite happy with that sort of grouping. Now, 14 months ago, five parties in the Riksdag supported a NATO option. For 14 months, the government has avoided uh, initiating broad discussions about this with looking at the different options on the table. And you, Håkan Svensson, the left party, it's a rhetoric issue or question, but what's your view on this? I mean, these five parties against the NATO, if there's anything that they have said is that we should have a discussion about it, but the government has just said no to that. Thank you. That's the end of that round of rejoinder. Back to the speaker's list. And the next speaker is Aron Emilsson from the Sweden Democrats, please. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Well, it is of course flattering to some extent to be the centrifugal force of Swedish uh, politics, also when discussing security and foreign policy between uh, in the struggle between the right wing and left wing. 
parties, but it is a turbulent time in foreign policy. Since the 17th of December in the law year of our Lord, 2021, we have to relate to a new reality when the Russian list of demands was published. Basically, cancelling the European security order, which has been in force in reality since the 1970s and confirmed as the Soviet Union fell approximately 30 years ago. The Russian demands are far-reaching and they uh, basically mean that Russia denies the right of Europe, Europe's states to choose their security solutions themselves. Based on the Russian r demands, US and Russia shall negotiate regarding Russia. Uh, over the heads of the Europeans. The seriousness of this new situation cannot be underlined sufficiently. And based on the discussion uh, in Sweden, we can never underline enough the importance of national cohesion in relation to the world around us. So it is sad to hear both representatives of the government and some other parties uh, that they focus their energy and their interest on a matter which is important, surely, however, uh, nevertheless only a vote yesterday in the European Parliament, where the Swedish MEPs from the Sweden Democrats uh, abstained from voting. If there's one party which has stood out in uh, being critical against Russia and Putin, both in the European Parliament and in uh, the Swedish Parliament, it is in fact the Sweden Democrats, if we look at hard facts in the matter. My co uh, colleague Charlie Weymersch has submitted 17 resolutions, 15 amendments and two written questions uh, inspired by Putin criticism forwarding proposals of Russian sanctions, etc., voted to stop Nord Stream 2 in favour of using the European peace facility to give support to Ukraine, etc. I recall that the only Swedish members of uh, Parliament who voted in favour of a Russian re-entry into the uh, uh, Council of Europe after the annexation of Crimea was um, in fact not the, it was not the, the Swedish representatives, they voted against this. But what has happened to Sweden's independence? We cannot freely choose our security policy alliances, seek membership in NATO or work with according to Russia, uh, work with NATO or US as we choose. Russia claims to have veto letters have been sent since the list was published to states in the OSCE where Russia expressed their desires for another security order. This is combined with a rearmament of significant scale in Russia. Approximately 100,000 participants in exercises recently in Belarus, for example, and in Barents Sea. New exercises and drills are taking place as a show of strength to show that they are able to act in several parts of Europe at the same time. A few weeks ago, Sweden was more directly concerned when disembarkation vessels were redirected uh, to uh, the Baltic Sea. And they've been now since been moved to the Black Sea, where they are part of the massing of forces around Ukraine. And it's still ongoing. And it's important to consider the situation in other parts of Europe as well. I'm thinking mainly here of the uh, actions taken by China. China has made joint statements, in fact, with Russia, supporting the Russian demands that NATO must not be extended or expanded. For a while now, Russia and China have had a cooperation in the military area in 2017. Both states carried out uh, military exercises and drills in the Baltic Sea. China, just like Russia over a longer term, has been involved in rearmament, mainly in shipbuilding in the marine area. The country now has the largest ship, counting uh, the number of ships, and also in nuclear. They've been rearming. And in Asia and uh, China, uh, China and Russia have territorial ambitions. They do not let their neighbors choose their security policy uh, solutions. Uh, Taiwan is one example. China has carried out several uh, flyovers around Taiwan. And there is a constant threat of military uh, actions from China. It's almost like a perfect storm where Russia and China Madam Speaker, have been involved in rearmament and now they support each other's power ambitions. Power ambitions like a hurricane leaving well-established security orders uh, in Tatras. The 
choice of language of power is clear, and it denies smaller countries the right to make their security policy choices themselves. Uh, if they are to be allowed to even exist as free states, according to the world order that China and Russia are proponents of. The pa language of power is clearest in relation to Ukraine, with the imminent danger of an invasion by Russia. The Ukraine people who has witnessed uh, war in their country ever since 2014, where parts have been annexed by Russia, are now under immense pressure, not just military pressure, but also uh, psychological pressure. Sweden needs to have a clear voice. It's now and in the future that declarations of the Swedish security policy line will be tried and tested. Our vote for freedom, independence and democracy and against Russian aggression need to be clear, unite and resolute. This is why it's highly unfortunate that the government chose uh, not to invite other parties to broad discussion on security policy a long time ago. And they also reacted very uh, slowly to the Russian requirements presented and demands presented in December 2021. Christmas and the New Year holidays surely cannot be uh, a sufficient excuse. The government has become clearer. I welcome this more recently. I want to make this clear in statements from the Prime Minister. The Russian demands have been condemned and it has been underlined that it's important not to, to question the, the European security order. And it appears that there will be invitations to discussions in the Defence Commission. That is also a positive step. However, I believe that Nordic cooperation is elementary when it comes to consensus. We share geography, cultural and linguistic proximity, um, systems of society and other cooperation structures, not least in security. The Nordic governments have declared that Nord the Nordics should be the world's most integrated and sustainable region. After the migration crisis in 2015 and several years under the corona pandemic, where Sweden adopted its own strategy, we're very far from such a reality. Be interested to hear the comment from uh, Madam Minister of whether you intend to step up the efforts to ensure that there is a crisis preparedness cooperation that we as parliamentarians across all the Nordic countries can encourage the uh, our countries to do and whether the governments will calibrate a joint Nordic uh, stance and approach in relation to Russia's aggression and intervention in Ukraine and in what manner. Russia are initiating an extensive uh, exercise in Bar the Barents Sea, the largest ever, and the security and safety of the Arctic area is something the Nordic countries have claimed and it is vital to maintain it. Thank you. Minister of Foreign Affairs and Linda of the Social Democrats, Hans Wallmark from the Moderate Party, Kerstin Lundgren of Centre Party, Hukan Svenling, the Left Party, you are for the Liberal Party, Maria Fram from the Green Party, have requested rejoinders to this address. Starting with the Minister for Foreign Affairs, you have the floor. Thanks, Otorma. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Sweden Democrats have always uh, had uh, this uh, love for the Hungarian government uh, led by Viktor Orban. And uh, we know that there are negative developments when it comes to the rule of law in, in Hungary. But now we have uh, actually today we had uh, this very positive ruling today at 9.30 is saying that uh, payments from the EU should be stopped to countries that do not fully respect the principles of uh, the rule of law. So it should cost you if you do not uh, do things correctly. And this is about Hungary and Poland, and that is uh, what has been tried in the EU court. And I would like to ask if you will support putting pressure on the Commission to stop payments to Hungary. Thank you. Thank you. And Aron Emilsson from the Sweden Democrats. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you for this question. I am one of those who, uh, over the past year, have led a working group in our party delegation on uh, freedom of expression and liberal uh, democracy. And we listed a number of measures and proposals to strengthen the situation for the freedom of speech in Europe. I've commented on the development both in Poland and Hungary when it comes to media policy and the rule of law, on several occasions, in fact. These, this sharp proposal is not one that I've had a chance to delve into yet. I'm entirely convinced that my colleagues in the European Parliament 
will be working on this and make their assessment based on what they believe is the uh, competence of the, the EU and which isn't uh, in other uh, areas, bilateral uh, action might be considered. But it's very important to underline that we, Sweden, and our neighboring countries as well, need to provide a role model, an example of how the principles for media, for the rule of law and democracy can develop. We need to do this through uh, conversations and dial in dialogue with other European countries. So I would imagine that we will get back to this. Thank you, Minister and Linda. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, most of the party groups in the European Parliament have been critical towards the Commission not really acting, not acting fast enough against Poland and Hungary. And my question is if you share that criticism within the Sweden Democrats. And we expect the European Commission to now act towards these two countries. And I cannot understand what needs to be investigated any further because we have this very clear ruling from the EU court. So my question remains the same. Will you help in putting pressure on the European Commission? And will you support Orban when there are elections in Hungary in April? Final rejoinder, Aron Ebelsson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Well, in general, we are in favour of ensuring that there's real activity with the high pace of reform in the areas where we support the actions of the European Parliament. We don't want to be involved in drawn out uh, elaborate red tape procedures. But I think it's important for issues to be dealt with at the right level. And so this is a matter for our members of the European Parliament. They have all this on their table and they have the factual uh, background information, which I don't have in full. So it's important to put the question to those uh, uh, who uh, are best placed to uh, reply to it. But it's important to respect uh, always the uh, principles of the rule of law. We need to make uh, sure that this is the case always. As for other European countries, they need to prepare their choices and run their campaigns, that it's not something that the Sweden Democrats are involved in in any way. We have no such public collaboration. Thank you. That concludes this round of rejoinder. Hans Wallmark of the Moderate Party has the floor for the next round of rejoinders. Madam Speaker, I've already managed to give praise to both the Social Democrats and the left, and I will continue. At least I will start with something nice to say also to the Sweden Democrats. And I do think that this is good, what you're saying, that you want this broad security policy talks. It is good and important that you say that so that the government would 100 mandates that they actually realize that that is the case. And Madam Speaker, when government now invites to talk with talks with the different political parties, then what we, the moderate party, what we defend is the right for all parties to participate, not just the Sweden Democrats, but also the left. We think that is just right and proper. And I do think that it is good what you did in the Council of Europe, in the Parliamentarian Assembly. You mentioned that Sweden let and the Social Democrats let Russia in. But now to criticism. Couldn't you just step out of your comfort zone? and regret what the Sweden Democrats did in the European Parliament yesterday. What Russia is doing today is that they are trying in every what way to undermine the situation, also financial aspects and the cyber attacks that are directed towards Ukraine. And it's only reasonable to expect that we help with Swedish financial funds and also through EU funds. One 
1.2 billion euro is what we're talking about, and it's needed in Ukraine. Of course, we can open up, I think, for defensive weapons, etc. But Aaron Emelson, couldn't you, couldn't you, being a Sweden Democrat in the Swedish parliament, couldn't you at least regret the decision that was made by the European parliamentarians from the Sweden Democrats by abstaining? And Aronson, please. Thank you, Madam Speaker. To begin with, it is highly relevant to start by declaring that there is a need for focused support and aid from Sweden to Ukraine. Let's begin there, based on this Swedish debate on foreign policy. I personally believe that it is a very positive thing to see that Sweden through the European Parliament have taken various actions and England, the Swedish government indeed, both financial support, supply of skills and competence, various types of mechanisms available to um, enhance and strengthen democracy and resilience in Ukraine. However, I wouldn't dare to uh, state whether it was correct or not to abstain in yesterday's vote on the matter that was dealt with at the European Parliament yesterday. I don't have all the facts in this matter. I doubt anyone else does here in this chamber either. But I don't think you can just hand out blank checks. There are issues to be dealt with in the Ukraine economy. Hans Wallmark, final rejoinder. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, just uh, to direct you, Aron Emilson, to something you can read when investigating what happened in the European Parliament yesterday. 598 MEPs voted in favour of that support package, 53 against and 43 abstained among those uh, three Sweden Democrats. Those who abstained and those who voted against, well, they came from different political groups. Some of them were NI, but m quite a few were f far left. And I have to ask you, isn't it a little bit uncomfortable looking at that situation? And regardless, well, talking about the European Parliament and after having talked to the European Parliament, I think that the Sweden Democrats in the Swedish Parliament should regret that decision not to support you, you, the Ukraine in the European Parliament. Final rejoinder. Thank you for talking Thank you, Madam Speaker. Of course, I need to have a, a more complete picture. I uh, intend to uh, look into that. But as far as I understand, there were concerns expressed by our MEPs that there hadn't been uh, uh, an opportunity provided to prepare this properly. I think all the procedures internally uh, in the European Parliament need to be respected and a number of financial support and aid packages had already been uh, tabled where uh, it was known that the Ukrainian uh, political and uh, financial setup would require more focused interventions. It can be for education, for defence supplies or other areas. If this, in fact, was the one and only truth that it had to be done in this way is not something I dare to surmise a guess as. But as Hans Wallmark said, uh, I'm sure that the company kept was not uh, entirely comfortable. Thank you. That concludes this round of rejoinders. Kerstin Lundgren has the floor for the next round of rejoinders. Thank you, Talman. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I would like to ask Aron Emilsson about uh, the Sweden Democrats and if you think that the EU is our most important arena when it comes to security policy. I would also like to ask about uh, what the EU court said when I read the resolution that encouraged uh, the Commission to start uh, these uh, proceedings against Hungary and Poland. The Sweden Democrats w were against that request. And, uh, among the Swedish parliamentarians that were present, the Sweden Democrats were the only ones who were against. So my question is, 
have you decided on a position not to use EU money to support when countries like Poland and Hungary now go against the rule of law? And I'm also curious about something else, Madam Speaker. Should Sweden respect that balance between the big powers? Looking at what was said in 2018, well, I don't know what the democracy is like in the Sweden Democrats, but I think that after that party leader debate back then, you changed position. And that was, you said, to avoid unnecessary misunderstandings. But I would like to know how that change came about and what it really means. What were the unnecessary misunderstandings that you wanted to avoid? Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you, Kerstin Lundgren. Those, that was uh, an entire set of questions. Let's see what I have time to uh, reply to. The EU issue, which is, uh, of course, our most important foreign policy arena. Our chain of dealing with this is the Nordic area, the Baltic, Arctic, Europe, rest of the world, in that order. So at the very top, we have well-functioning collaborations with our uh, fellow Nordic countries and then our Baltic cousins. But in addition to that and beyond that, the EU is an important player today. That is some, not something we would disregard. But there has been criticism expressed by our party for a long time as to the supranationality of the EU, the Lisbon Treaty and a number of measures taken since, uh, taken far too much decision-making power away from the national level to the federal EU system. And to me, this is still a matter of um, a problem of principle. There are also uh, outstanding question marks still on the strategic compass of the EU. How is it going to impact the national sovereignty? Also, technically, it hasn't been fully investigated as far as I'm concerned. There are put there's potential opportunities with fighting cross-border crime, climate and the environment, etc. But there are also problems such as uh, losing decision-making competence uh, that could be kept at national, regional or local level in Sweden. As for the matter of striking a balance between uh, greater powers, I would put it to you that this wording clearly has created more questions than answers. That's unfortunate and regrettable, but what you tend to lose here is the fact that in the same uh, sentence we talk about how positive you forget that we talk about how much in favor we are of NATO and the US etc thank you very much final rejoinder thank you madam speaker I heard a no I did hear a no that Sweden or the EU is not Sweden's most important foreign policy arena that was a no to that question from our Amazon from the Sweden Democrats and I note also when I read the Sweden uh, Democrats uh, website it does say that foreign policy when it comes to the EU shall be to facilitate for the return of individuals who are illegally in Europe mm. that seems to be the Sweden Democrats view on the uh, task of for the EU's foreign policy which is a rather odd stance to take I would say but I'm still curious with regard to the balance the Sweden Democrats, what's your view on this balance issue? You said that it was a, based on a balance and a dialogue between Russia and the US. Is that the case? Thank you. Final rejoinder from Aaron uh, Emerson from the Sweden Democrats, please. Thank you, Talman. Uh... Thank you, Madam Speaker. Well, of course, one part in uh, my understanding of this uh, when this wording was uh, conceived that there should be a considerable cost for larger powers to attack each other or to attack smaller countries and that uh, we require a, an extensive diplomacy rolled out before uh, you get to such a point and so there are benefits of striking a balance in this context but when you speak of 
a balance. I'd like to turn this question around and ask Kerstin Lundgren and the Centre Party this. The Centre Party has written that Sweden should be a driver to reduce the threat of nuclear and contribute to a balanced disarmament. Why would you not prefer that Russia, North Korea and other aggra aggressive nuclear powers with both the necessary skills and who hold nuclear should take a higher, shoulder a higher degree of responsibility? Thank you. This concludes this round of rejoinders. We will now conclude uh, and continue with the next round of rejoinders. Håkan Svendling has asked for the floor. Madam Speaker, in October 2019, uh, United or Unified Rigsa stopped the weapon, export of weapons to Turkey of an initiative from the left party and the Liberals. And this initiative came after Turkey had attacked the Kurdish dominated areas of Rojava and Afrin in Syria. An important meeting before that decision uh, was a meeting where the Kurdistan network of the parliament met the PW, uh, TPYD. And at the meeting, we received tangible, relevant information about Turkey's attack and a discussion about starting this ban on exports. That's where that came from. And the, at the meeting, a couple of representatives from the, the Sweden Democrats were participated. And the Kurdish opposition uh, against the terrorist group IS has been given a lot of attention, especially what uh, defense of the uh, border state Kobani. That's why there were many people who wondered when, in the autumn, when uh, Jimmy Orkerson, the party leader of the Sweden Democrats, when they voted on uh, the prime minister on the 20th of November, uh, attacked the Kurds and in position, and in particular PYD, by calling them terrorists. As, and also, we were also uh, rather surprised by the former foreign policy spokesperson from. Sweden Democrats who travelled to Syria to meet Bashar al-Assad. We all know that the regime in Damascus is being supported by Russia, militarily as well as financially. When civil rights defenders um, in the winter of 2020 started a campaign against dictators against around the world, the Bashar, uh, against Bashar al-Assad and Putin, then so the Sweden Democrats started to call into question their state support in articles in newspapers, etc., and uh, Björn Söder from the, your colleague, uh, Aaron Emerson, was responsible for this. Do you believe that the Kurds in Syria who are defending themselves against Turkey, that they are terrorists? Is it Erdogan, Putin and Bashar al-Assad that you support? Emil Andersson, please. Link for frågan. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you, Håkan Svenneling, for this question and an opportunity to reply. No is the clear answer. We those who defend and fight uh, f for Kurdish, Kurdish independence are to a very large majority not terrorists. But one of our major arguments in uh, favor of not uh, allowing Turkey to uh, join the EU or NATO fully has been our criticism of uh, Erdogan with very clear language in those terms. Part of what Håkan Svendling is referring to uh, took place uh, before I took up my um, seat on the Committee of Foreign Affairs and uh, the spokesperson on uh, foreign affairs issues. But I know and I've been involved in discussions with parts of the Kurdish movement present here in Sweden. And they've expressed to me the needs they have identified and, and what they see needs to be done on site. I'm still interested in listening to those voices to see if we can make contributions to uh, contribute to strengthening their situation and their ability to defend their territory. Thank you. Final rejoinder. Madam Speaker, that's obviously the case that the Sweden Democrats are very inconsistent when it comes to Syria uh, between the party, the party leader and the foreign policy spokesman. They give completely different views about this and they find it difficult understanding who or, or who they're going to or distinguishing rather between those who wish to builds democracy in those who want dictatorship and terrorism. Now, it's not easy to take over uh, the role as a foreign policy spokesperson, but let's say that many of we do have close contacts between us, and I would like to give uh, Aaron Emerson the advice that he does take that com uh, contact. 
Now, two weeks ago, Turkey bombed Kurds in Iraq and Syria, and I asked the foreign minister whether she condemned those bonding, bo bombings, so I'm asking the Sweden Democrats the same thing. Thank you. Aaron Emerson for a final rejoinder, please. Thank you, Talman. Uh... Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm pleased to see that Håkan Svenneling is also anxious to ensure that we have close contacts and relations between Sweden Democrats here in the Riksdag and in the European Parliament. And I can assure you that that is the case on a very regular daily basis. And I'm very familiar with what happened at the vote yesterday in Brussels, uh, in the Parliament. But it's important to underline uh, that uh, we should stay away from more uh, e extreme discussions, highlighting only one single vote to try and uh, paint the picture of... Uh, the Sweden Democrats being a Russia-friendly party, because, of course, uh, with a number of other parties in the European Parliament, uh, we have a very stable uh, result. We have 13 resolutions, 54 amendments, a number of Putin-critical uh, questions have been asked and, and tabled respectively by the uh, Sweden Democrats. We have the peace facility that we're in favour of using. We want to put a hold to two Nord Stream 2. And there are a number of parties who have a less high performing uh, result in their uh, back books. Thank you. You were for Shell is next for a render rejoinder for the Liberal Party. good. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you, Aaron Emerson, for your uh, presentation. But uh, I think it's very positive that you uh, touched upon China and Taiwan, which I find was found was very pleasing. And my first question is, in fact, uh, whether you condemn the aggression of China vis-à-vis -vis, uh, Taiwan, just as the Liberal Party does. And my second question is about Ukraine, because naturally uh, the aggression and uh, that we see uh, against Ukraine uh, is also an attack on Sweden, because it's an attack on the European security order. And when we defend Sweden, it's, of course, reasonable to support Ukraine in every possible way. And it was very unfortunate, therefore, that the Sweden Democrats voted against the financial uh, support package voted on yesterday in the European Parliament. And naturally, naturally, that, of course, does give rise to the question of what the Sweden Democrats would do in Sweden. Would you, the Sweden Democrats, if we had a similar proposal here in Sweden, would you support it or not? I think that would uh, be rather unfortunate if you didn't. If you don't support Ukraine, then you support the Kremlin, quite simply. My third question is with regard to the rule of law. And you so you do want to criticise the EU because you say that or you criticise the EU because it decides too much and you normally say that there is a national competence there. So the Sweden Democrats, do you therefore mean that the rule of law, and supporting the rule of law, is a question that each separate country decides on? Or is this an issue, just as we believe the Liberals, that the EU and other countries, we have the right and obligation to interfere if there are violations or infringements against the rule of law. Thank you. Rejoinder from Aaron Ibbeson. Uh, for self for thank, you, thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you to you for self for those questions. Taiwan and the security political situation in that region, yes, I very much condemn the situation, and we do this as a party as well. It's very tragic and uh, very concerning indeed, the uh, uh, upscaling of uh, movements that we've seen from China. We hope that further action can be taken and that we can be clear in relation to China on this matter. As for the matter of Ukraine, I've uh, outlined a number of measures and steps taken, not least in, uh, in the European Parliament, but we've also taken and we've been very uh, unified in the uh, Committee on Foreign Affairs in uh, the Riksdag when it comes to Ukraine and uh, our views on Russia. What I've understood uh, in relation to the matter uh, of the vote at the European Parliament yesterday, there was a criticism on the process, the procedural issues uh, involved, some concerns with the objections of the technical components in this proposal. And often, it is often the case, unfortunately, um, not just at the European Parliament, but in particular, you need to vote in favour of an entire package, and you might be opposed to one or two parts, and if so, you need to vote against the entire package or abstain. But there is also another issue at stake here. 
I uh, understand that my European Parliament uh, MEP colleagues have been in favor of a number of uh, other proposals to provide aid to Ukraine. They've been uh, proponents of the peace facility to strengthen Ukraine, both uh, in uh, all manners possible, but you cannot uh, simply sign a blank check when we know that there are problems with the Ukraine e economy and there have, uh, they've had some difficulties in uh, managing larger contributions in aid. But we have a strong uh, and extensive aid provided by Sweden, and I'm not opposed to additional proposals tabled here in the Swedish Riksdag. Have a look at it. Thank you. You are for some final rejoinder for the Liberal Party. And you're, you're welcome. Thank you. Now, I uh, a piece about the response about Taiwan, but not Ukraine. Now, sometimes in politics, you actually have to take a stance with what's, what's there. You can't sort of look at the detail too much. You may lack detail. There might be detail that you're against, but you still need to look at the, the, the take the holistic approach and this package was support that Ukraine really needs and the Sweden Democrats said no to that. That is very, very unfortunate because if you don't support Ukraine, you support the Kremlin. But I didn't get a response to my second question either, which is about the rule of law and the principles of the rule of law, because the, I and the Liberals, we believe that the principles of the rule of law need to be upheld throughout the world and they sh it's up to us, all of us, to ensure that. And it's not something that shall be just left to each country to do that. If you don't do that, follow the principles of the rule of law, others need to interfere. So should the EU interfere when this is not the case or not? Final reply from Aaron, uh, Aaron Emerson, please. Um. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you for this follow-up question. I am... Uh a proponent of the rule of law always globally at European level at the level of the Nordics and I've also stated earlier that the Nordic countries provides a real role model to other regions to follow in uh, their foot uh, path in, in the Nordic Council and Nordic cooperation at various levels. We always underline this, and I've done this previously in my role as responsible and spokesperson for media-related issues. I've spoken up against both Poland and Hungary and some of the developments w we've seen there. As for national competence, there is a problem, of course, when a constitutional court in an EU country makes one assessment and the EU Court of Justice another, and you're fail to agree on what applies. It should be underlined and, and promoted that the principles of the rule of law should underpin everything that we do. We can do this uh, together, but uh, whether this is best decided at national level or European level is a matter for some discussion, because national sovereignty is important after all. Thank you. That concludes this round of rejoinder. Now Maria Farm has asked for the floor for a rejoinder. Please go ahead. Mr. Speaker, I would also like to touch upon the security policy situation. And the situation today is very unique, and special. And the vote yesterday with regard to Ukraine is rather strange, I must say. It's just odd here that in this position there's a huge need in Ukraine for financial support, and the Sweden Democrats were the only party that did not do so, support this package of measures. And uh, this is very strange, bearing in mind what you said earlier in this debate, that the EU should do things uh, and work efficiently in areas where they can do things. And at the same time, in this situation, in this vote, which was about 1.2 billion euros for Ukraine, then say that it all went too quickly, despite the fact that, that everything, the procedures were as per usual and, and so on. And there wasn't time for a long, drawn-out bureaucratic, bureaucratic process. But you still made the assessment and believed that in this particular situation, it wasn't, that, it wasn't reasonable to support the decision. But that wasn't my question, actually. But another thing that I wanted to say was that it becomes painfully clear 
how you, there's a link between security policy and energy policy, and we do know that fossil uh, gas, for example, comes from Russia, and that the EU is very dependent on Russia in that respect. And that is a particular problem when decisions can't be made sensibly or it works against the EU. And we, uh, so my question is, what do you think about that? Thank you. Aaron, Aaron Emerson from the Sweden Democrats, please. For frågan. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Maria Farm, for uh, this uh, question. Starting with Ukraine, I've stated already previously that, based on the information I've received yesterday on the vote and the, the way this matter was dealt with at the European Parliament, on the one hand, there were technical objections to how parts of the package had been designed. That was one reason to abstain from voting in this particular case, but that there were also some objections on the uh, absorption capacity of, uh, for this financial aid in Ukraine, considering the fact that you also need to make an assessment on what type of support will have the best impact. I can make references, for example, to uh, the EU peace facility, where you could give support to Ukraine, uh, enhancing their political and, and military muscles, as it were. There's also uh, extensive bilateral support from Sweden to Ukraine, of course. As for energy dependency, we've uh, pointed out for a while now that not least uh, the government early closure of Swedish uh, Nuclear power has led to the current energy crisis we see in this country with a severe hike in energy prices, uh, uh, injustice in access to energy because we do not have stable energy sources, and the risks increase, therefore, of us becoming dependent of Russian uh, gas and Russian energy. Uh, highly unfortunate, in fact. We've been critical of Nord Stream 2 previously and larger parts of Europe becoming more dependent on Russia, which is a way for Putin to uh, gain in influence, uh, not least uh, when intervening against a European uh, consumption needs. So the development is a cause for concern. We need to refocus and ensure stable Swedish access to energy for Swedish society. Thank you. Maria Fam. Thank you, Speaker. Oh, we're not just talking about coal, oil and, and gas, where so much comes from Russia, but it's also a matter of nuclear power and enriched uh, uh, uranium, uh, for example, comes from Russia. And so nuclear power, saying nuclear power is the solution to the uh, dependency uh, on Russia is perhaps not right. Uh, in fact, it's incorrect. And security policy-wise, uh, renewables is, of course, the safest option. But the fact of the matter is that we import such, uh, such a large amount of enriched uranium from Russia is a huge problem. Um, especially when nuclear power is then always mentioned as the safe option. It's not. And Putin can, has used this also as a further issue here. So what's your view on nuclear power and security policy? Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for this uh, follow-up uh, question. It's problematic. Uh, uh, and it's not easy to give a right answer. It is very problematic that we have uh, this type of import uh, enriched uranium from Russia and that we're using it to such an extent, because this also has a security policy dimension that we would not want to see. And it's not just positive, but uh, rather another reason why we should develop a new generation of uh, nuclear power in Sweden, where we could also look at new ways to get uranium in Sweden, from Sweden, because we have those possibilities, and that would also provide another type of stability, not the least when it comes to our geology, so to say. It is stable here with nuclear, and, well, we have wind, but we do not have the technology to store it. Thank you. That concludes that set of rejoinders, and uh, these rejoinders are thereby concluded, and we continue with the next address, which is uh, Kerstin Lundgren from the Centre Party.
Talman Nerber. Mr. Speaker, when the Berlin Wall fell and when the, the Soviet Empire was uh, dissolved 30 years ago, a door was opened for peaceful coexistence in Europe. Relaxation was a reality, but that was interrupted by the Russian-Georgian War 2008 and the Russian occupation that followed of 20% of Georgian territory, Abkhazia and Tinchvali, two Georgian regions that Russia said were states where they moved troops into them. And Kremlin showed us that Russia under Putin had started a new era of building an empire with new conflicts, not between the East and the West as uh, during the Cold War, but between autocracy and democracy. The illiberal democracy is growing in our Europe and also globally. 68% of the world's population today live in auto autocracies. And uh, these autocrats, they dislike uh, democracies. They try to polarize. Uh, they try to scare Mongols, saying that uh, uh, free and open societies threaten traditional values, culture, religion, traditional values. Uh, where minorities uh, are being oppressed. Human rights, uh, freedom, journalists, oppositionals, uh, women's movements, free academies and independent judges are claimed to, to threaten these traditional values. And we have to stand up to defend human rights uh, and we have to stand up for women's rights and against oppression. We have to stand up against uh, the brave Belarusian opposition against uh, the illegitimate uh, Lukashenko. We have to stand up and defend people. For example, in China, when the citizen Gui Minhai is being kidnapped, or when Uyghurs in Xinjiang are put in camps to dis extinguish their identity, when we see that the democracy is closed and done away with in Hong Kong, uh, Jinping, Putin, Maduro, Lukashenko, Assad, Erdogan, Khamenei, well, there's a long list of gentlemen. And the list could also be long if we were to list uh, everyone, these gentlemen, in prison, torture or even murder because they feel threatened, because they want to present warning examples. Mr. Speaker, it is time now for a new global wave of democracy, and that should be the guiding star of uh, Swedish foreign policy. The EU is our most important uh, security policy and foreign policy arena. We should stand up for those values that the EU are built upon, democracy, human rights, independent judicial system, and we should ensure that we act when these values are being threatened inside or outside the Union. We welcome the fact that the EU now finally has agreed on a global regime of sanctions, the Magnitsky sanctions, but it has to be made more efficient when we see corruption money laundering, well, the blood circulation of autocracies, that has to be included. And we have to stand up when it comes to sanctions against Russia. Now, when Ukraine is being exposed to, to additional aggression, and we have to show that we stand up towards this power of corruption, and we need to extend the Magnitsky sanctions and use sanctions in Sweden and in the EU. We cannot rule out an attack on our country, on a neighboring country in the EU, and we can not imagine a military conflict in our neighborhood that would impact only one country. And Sweden should not remain passive if a disaster or an attack were to hit another country, and we expected these neighboring countries to act in the same way if we are impacted. The host country agreement and uh, our exercises give credibility to this promise and our solidarity in our security policy provides stability within the EU, amongst the Nordic countries and NATO. And we should stand strong. Our solidarity helps us build security. And without this solidarity, like the Supreme Commander says, we will not have have uh, defense policy. Sweden is not neutral, but 
uses solidarity if there is a Russian aggression. And of course, every country can decide for themselves how to exercise, how to build their security. Uh, and Kreml doesn't have a say when it comes to Sweden, but the Swedish parliament does. The Swedish parliament has said when it comes to NATO that we should have a door kept open for a membership, just like Finland is coping, keeping a door open. And this is no secret that the center party would like to see a Swedish membership, preferably together with Finland, if and when. That, however, is a decision for Sweden and Sweden alone, and we should not have a referendum on our security policy. Mr. Speaker, it's not the Russian population that is threatening the European security order. It is Kreml under the rule of Putin, and this ongoing aggression has to be broken. And we need to be very clear and use uh, every mean that we can to deter such a thing. Here we have to stand united between the EU, NATO and the USA. And we have to make sure that what Putin is trying to accomplish is stopped also when it comes to hybrid warfare. And uh, Anna Stations like Luhensk, Donetsk, Chikani, well, we have to meet these actions and we need to help Ukraine to safeguard their sovereignty. We need to support it with many um, efforts and also defense material if necessary. Today we see this attack against Ukraine, but Georgia, Moldavia and other sovereign states are also being threatened by Kreml. And all our security is being threatened. And that Kreml door for relaxation, it has been closed. And now we have to act based on this Russian neo-imperialism that we see today. And we have to understand that there are many people fighting for human rights and democracy. Mr. Speaker, climate change due to global warming, that is also a growing threat against our safety. And it's about our societies, their survival, our children that will carry this responsibility that we haven't been able to manage. And here we have to have solidarity. We need to work together. And we need to do that also to manage the climate objectives. And we need to act globally because climate does not know any borders. And Swedish aid, of course, is important, an important part of the efforts to create a sustainable, inclusive world. And the Centre Party stands up for uh, foreign aid of 1% of BNI. And uh, this is something that uh, we will touch upon later uh, today. Also, the same thing goes for our Nordic collaboration. Thank you. And thank you. And the following have asked for rejoinders. Foreign Minister Anne Linde, Hans Wallmark, uh, Aron Emelsson, Håkan Svenneling, Lars Aktesson, Joel Forsell. The, and we begin with the, the rejoinder from the Foreign Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Now, one of the main priorities of this government is a fight against organized crime. Uh, which is why together with my Slovakian uh, co colleague and five other countries, we have in fact taken this issue to Superel, the highest level, and the French presidency, that we need to introduce further um, measures, for example, like uh, sanctions against corruption. And we need to work within the EU, and it's good that we have joint initiatives with several other member states. So organized crime and serious corruption are always always work cross borders which is why the foreign ministers of the eu need to work together on these issues and the seven countries that have uh, signed this agreement so, so the baltics czech uh, czechia uh, slovakia finland and sweden and have been involved in this issue for a long time so shashin lungin what have you done to get your party friends in other member states to support sweden in, on this issue please Herr Talman. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This is an issue that we're discussing on an ongoing basis, and we're also doing that at European level within ALDE. And we have also required that Sweden should not just 
ask the EU to do things, but uh, we should act themselves. We see that many of our sister parties have taken the lead to have sanctions from their respective countries. It is possible. And here in the parliament, we have actually discussed uh, the Manitsky sanctions during a specific seminar, and we have discussed how to use them to fight corruption and money laundering. It is uh, possible. And we had uh, a visitor from Estonia here to tell us and give us examples as to how powerful this can be. And it is possible. Unfortunately, the government, the foreign minister, haven't been all that interested. And I welcome the fact that you're now acting. That's good. And that was uh, something, well, I've asked many questions throughout the years, and the, many of them have been about this. As the foreign minister, knows and the answer has always been that it's not possible just a tiny country here or there is doing this but now it is good if the foreign minister can actually see that we can work together with other countries to do this and we should also have uh, sanctions from sweden corresponding to magnitsky uh, to fight corruption and money laundering thank you thank you foreign minister thank you now unfortunately there are far too few countries that uh, have drawn the same uh, conclusions that we have done here. And we often see that what's called the Magnitsky regulation or law uh, sanctions, uh, HR abuse is, should be used first. Now, we've seen that they are effective and efficient, but could perhaps be used in more places. But my question was about organized crime and the international link and so I'd like to hear more about that. And also the Centre Party, whether you're prepared to work more on this, to use foreign policy to get at international organised crime. Thank you. Final rejoinder from Chatin Lulia, please. Well, of course, there is no reason to not say that we should try to fight organized crime. And the EU is an important actor. But we also have to act when we see, for example, that Interpol has uh, used information to fight uh, that information from Interpol has been used by autocrats uh, to imprison people. And so they're using Interpol. If they cannot kidnap or hijack planes, then they're using that information. So we have to be careful. And here, in such a collaboration, we have to be clear. And then we have something else, and that is aid. And uh, we cannot do what the government has been hinted at uh, in other contexts, uh, saying that uh, if uh, you're not behaving, then we'll reduce uh, foreign aid. That is not a model we want to use. Uh, thank you. And that concludes uh, that set of rejoinders. And we continue with next and with Hans Wallmark from the Moderate Party. Mr. Speaker, now in my rejoinders, I've tried to start with something nice about the party that I'm talking to, the Social Democrats, the Left Party, the Sweden Democrats, and I'm going to try and do the same with the Centre Party. And I think that the rejoinder between the Foreign Minister and Shashin Lungen was in fact very positive because what Shashin did and was that she consistently, and she has done this before, that is to broaden the tool sanctions and which is why you in your rejoinder to me last year in this debate you said quite in a friendly manner and let me say that you we have looked at this and we have taken the same path as Shashi Lunga and the Centre Party which I would say really shows the value the strength of debate in a democratic parliament and I could also say that I really appreciate the Centre Party that they're open to defensive weapons for example to to uh, help support Ukraine with that of course if it doesn't isn't a detriment to our own um, defence capabilities now, I can see that there are other uh, Centre Party representatives here. Um, so let me say to the Centre Party, could you, just like the Moderate Party in the Defence Committee, 
say that we need to look at the security analysis that has been made, given the fact that we have these very serious threat, uh, threats from Russia vis-à-vis -vis, uh, EU security policy and security order. So not just redistribution of resources, but actually to open up for new funding to our defence, actually, to enhance our defence system. Because now we had a debate yesterday, but, but we need to also show, give a clear message that there are similarities between the, um, between the parties in the government vis-à-vis uh, -vis the uh, party with 100 seats. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to Hans uh, Waldmark as well, and thank you for supporting our proposal for a um, NATO option, because it was our suggestion, after all, that you voted in favour of. And uh, thank you also for changing your mind when it comes to the Manitsky uh, sanctions and broaden those so that we can act also when we see corruption and money laundering being done in a systematic way. We have been clear from the Centre Party all along. We have been trying to push the government into action. Also, when it comes to the Defence Commission in the past, and in the past it was to get more money for the Swedish defence. We have been the ones who have been active to raise the bar, and we're prepared. And uh, my colleague, uh, Daniel Beckstrom, he's going to talk about this, that we're also prepared to give more funding to the defence during this budget period. And we have an objective that is uh, clear, going towards uh, 2%. When it comes to the security policy analysis, well, we have written an article together, the Centre Party and the Moderate Party, the respective party leaders, we have also highlighted these issues. And now the government has given this mandate to the Defence Commission. And of course, we feel that it's obvious that we should have such a security policy analysis made. And it is important that we have the parliament supporting this security policy debate. We should have more than a declaration. And uh, I encourage you to support our proposal that we should have an account regarding security policy presented to the parliament. Thank you. And Hans Wallmark, please. Thank you. Now, with all this basket of friendliness, let me just also say that Chatin Lunga, she is wearing a, a Ukrainian symbol there, which I think is very positive, I must say. But anyway, basically, I do think that what the moderate party wishes to do, we want to, within Rikstra, we can, must be able to participate with all the other seven parties in this Rikstra. I think that's very positive, and it's very positive what Chastin Lundgren is saying, that we have similar views with regard to NATO, the NATO options, supporting Ukraine, same policy with regard to expanding the Magnitsky policy. But I think it's good that more parties can be clear vis-à-vis -vis the government when the Defence Committee starts its work this afternoon that we need more new funding to reinforce Swedish defence. Thank you. Final response from Chatting Lundgren, please. No. Oh. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. That is uh, the case. The Centre Party has been leading the way in many of these areas that we've touched upon, and we've been pushing the government to give more funding to our defence, for example. And what has made a difference is that the Centre Party has had this tenacity not to just to talk to everyone, but also to make agreements across party borders and to make agreements with the government. And the moderate party, I have to say, and this is a negative comment towards the end, unfortunately, but you have shown us that you didn't really have that strength. You say that you want to talk to everyone, but you're not really willing to agree with everyone. But there we're different. We want to make these agreements also with the government. And we're very clear when it comes to what we have in the fringes. Thank you. And that concludes that set of rejoinders. And we continue with the Sweden Democrats and Aaron Aronson.
Tack till talman. Thank you Mr Speaker. The Centre Party recently has focused on the issues of balance as we've heard. And I have a question about a wording I find on your website. And it deals with disarmament and uh, nuclear which we dealt with in the committee recently. You say that Sweden should be a driver to reduce the nuclear threat and contribute to a balanced disarmament. But here's my question, given the current situation that we are in. Why are you not focusing in particularly uh, on uh, disarmament by Russia, mainly for tactical nuclear weapons? They have a uh, higher rate of those than even the US. Or what about the North uh, Korean situation in breach of international law? You need to have everyone with uh, nuclear cap capability on board, um, not, including all those who already have, rather than just knowledge. How would you destruct knowledge after all? This is perhaps not a demand which can be realized in actual practice. So my question to Kerstin Lundgren is what you mean with the wording that you read on the Centre Party website. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, uh, the Centre Party wants uh, to see a world free of nuclear weapons, and we have been incredibly clear also in the committee for a long time. We have said that we have to go through the NPT. That is the way to go, and that is uh, what has to be our objective, to strengthen the non-proliferation treaty. We shouldn't go through the prohibition treaty, because uh, there in that uh, proposal on prohibition, we have another type of policy where it's uh, an imbalance in disarmament, where we wouldn't be able to create security. The world looks the way it does. And then we need to have a balanced disarmament, we feel. We do not want to end up in a security situation where Russia or North Korea are there with nuclear weapons, these uh, autocracies. And then the Western countries have gotten rid of their nuclear weapons. That is impossible, we feel. We have to work within the NPT and we have to have a balanced disarmament. And I hope that this will happen, not in the near future, but in the future. And I hope we will live to see it happen. Thank you. Or on Amazon. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And thank you, Kerstin Lundgren, for this uh, reply. It is a reply indeed, but at the same time it has to be uh, important and uh, a priority for all parties in this chamber to have a strong wording and um, focus also on an imbalance of disarmament with countries in particular who are in breach of international conventions and agreements. Enough said about that. Security and working to promote security at all levels contains many different dimensions. Cyber warfare has been mentioned recently, for example. And I have a question on the uh, on Mikael Yixel from Gothenburg, who is now the party leader of the Islamist extremist party uh, Nuance. He has been uh, excluded. Uh, he's been expelled from the party, I understand. But at the same time, there are extensive disinformation campaigns uh, that government agencies on psychological defense have warned against. There are, uh, this party is clearly Islamistic, and I'd like a comment from Kerstin Lindgren. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, uh, to hear this from the Sweden Democrats, a party uh, that has had a civil servant uh, employed in the parliament, who has now been banned from the parliament premises because he's considered a security risk. Well, taking that into consideration, I wonder how you manage that type of a contact. And uh, the previous uh, security policy spokesman, Richtholt, uh, has you also been involved in making announcements, participating in media, 
uh, where it's obvious that uh, you're assisting Russia. So this is what we see from members and employees of uh, the Sweden Democrats. We, we have um, removed that person from our party and uh, we can we support in no way that party. That uh, concludes that uh, set of rejoinders, and we continue with the Håkan Svengelin and the left. Herr Talman. Mr. Speaker, when I listen to Kerstin Lundgren, uh, the TV program Bachelorette springs to mind. In the rose ceremony, Lundgren isn't quite decided on who to give the final rose to. The question is whether any party would like to receive this rose from the Centre Party, not even the Social Democrats, because no other party than that of the confused Centre Parties will change partners in politics as often as they do. She doesn't know exactly what she wants or how many, with so many partners or other parties as possible seems to be the aim. One day it's the Social Democrats and the next day they are betrayed for the moderate party, the centre party, the bachelorette of the Riksdag. One day you are focusing on regional policy, in defence policy issues, on where to position and locate regiments, forcing the government to do what you uh, wish, and then the next day you make announcements on NATO options against the government. It's not easy for the Minister of Defence, Peter Hultqvist, to deal with you. When the moderate party come up, they don't have to respond to your rejoinders, but you put ask rejoinders of others. And the great losers are, of course, the Swedish government. Not only do they have to live with an SD-impacted budget, thanks to the Centre Party, their actions also create uncertainty as to what the position of Sweden is when it comes to security policy. So here we are, Shastling, and it's time for the final rose ceremony. Which party will receive your rose to get take the responsibility for Sweden's security? Talman, are you in Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, this is interesting. Here in the chamber, we get to learn about uh, what TV shows uh, Håkan Svenneling is looking at and what his preferences are. I have to admit that I haven't seen this uh, TV show that he's talking about. I hope for your understanding. But I also understand that, well, Håkan Svenneling is talking about roses. Uh, we are usually talking about clubs. <laughs> that is the symbol of our party. And um, Mr. Speaker, the left party, well, their history is exciting. And I don't know what flowers you are handing out and to whom, but we are clear saying that we do not want to work together with the left party. And it seems that you have removed yourself even further left compared to what you had before your election Congress. But we're very clear, we do not want to collaborate with the Sweden Democrats. But we have seen, Mr. Speaker, that the left party has no problem whatsoever when it comes to cooperating with the Sweden Democrats. You decide on policy, you get rid of governments, and you do that because you dislike liberal reforms. But we Mr. Speaker, we like liberal reform and we will be prepared to work very intensely to carry out more of those reforms with the parties that stand up for liberal reforms. And I do not think I've seen any such proposals from the left party. Usually your proposals, they head in a completely different directions. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, it's unfortunate that Kerstin Lundgren hasn't watched what most uh, people in Sweden probably does watch, even though it's usually referred to as, um, as uh, garbage programs. But um, it's unfortunate that it's unclear who the Centre Party would like to work with and how you'd like to clarify the security policy. I work with, um, not with roses, of course, with other types of uh, flowers, but um, we have had peace in Sweden for 200 years. But Sweden, as uh, Kerstin Lundgren would like to not have a referendum put to the Swedish uh, people. Rather, she wants to ignore their will and join NATO. But there's one conflict of, of 
different targets after another. This lays the foundation for this uncertainty currently in the Swedish policy. Final rejoinder. Man. And thank you, Mr. Speaker. The left party might feel and think that, uh, well, they are upset, uh, have been badly treated because they have because the Centre Party has been clear in saying that we are not carrying out liberal reforms with uh, any what party. The left party and the Sweden Democrats, uh, well, they both dislike liberal reform. And that is why we have been clear in saying that we do not want to cooperate with those two parties. And we're being clear. But the left party, you're willing to make a deal with anyone. And Mr. Speaker, when looking at what happened when the government was formed in 2014, uh, then we had uh, the Social Democrats and the Greens and the left party sort of were involved. And perhaps that was when you changed your security policy line about uh, NATO membership. And that was that. Thank you. That concludes that set of rejoinders. And we continue with the Christian Democrats and Lars Adaktusson, please. Mr. Speaker, the Russian aggression towards the Ukraine brings to uh, the table a number of issues in security policy. We've heard one mentioned, nuclear and the importance of disarmament, a central element in that task since the end uh, of the 1960s is the Non-Proliferation Treaty. And MPT, which has contributed to reduce the nuclear arsenals in this world. But instead of safeguarding MPT, ever since 2017, intense efforts are made to drive through a UN convention on a ban on nuclear arms. The Centre Party and the Christian Democrats have a strong involvement in matters of disarmament, but as opposed to the government and the political left, our parties also Justin Lungen considered that the convention for a ban is counterproductive unless all nuclear powers and countries such as North Korea and Iran were to join. And unfortunately, we are not in such a place. Mr. Speaker, if the ban convention and the government's actions uh, it, when it comes to those two, an initiative was tabled by the Christian Democrats. We believe that the Swedish position needs to be clarified. We want to prevent the government from single-handedly signing, ratifying uh, and becoming an observer to this convention on a ban. There's a majority in uh, the Riksdag to support that uh, stance, including the Centre Party. Nevertheless, they choose, together with the government, and the other backing parties of the government to reject the committee initiative tabled. Why, Shastin Lungen, do you not stand up for your beliefs? Shastin Lungen? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This is uh, exciting. Right now, we are uh, discussing uh, a proposal that is in committee, and this will be discussed in committee tomorrow. And then we will also be able to deepen that discussion that the Christian Democrats have presented a proposal in committee. That is true, and we're totally in agreement that uh, Sweden should not sign the prohibition treaty. And I assume that it, this will be discussed in Parliament as well, once it's here, ready for the chamber. But what we have said is that we can accept that Sweden participates in that we can listen when we have the first conference on the topic. And that is because to have uh, those ears there in that environment, that could be important. We do not want the prohibition treaty to 
become any type of jumping board for leaving NPT. NPT is key. And that is why it's important to, to try to fight those who want to have a prohibition to prevent them to preventing them from causing a situation where people leave NPT and join the prohibition treaty instead because with the security policy situation being the way it is it will be very very difficult to reach an agreement and reach a, a concrete agreement with this new proposal it was difficult last time and it will be even more difficult now so that is why we are very very cautious and we do not want to, to disrupt the npt review that is underway and mr speaker i heard what lars adakto said and uh, remember uh, that Iran voted in favor of uh, the prohibition treaty, just like Sweden. So an interesting collection of countries. Lars Adaktesson. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Kerstin Lundgren made an attempt at explaining, but it uh, seems somewhat complicated. She says that Sweden shouldn't sign and not, shouldn't ratify uh, the convention uh, ban. However, the government, without a mandate from the parliament, uh, the Riksdag, should still be able to become an observer to this convention. That is a very unusual stance, in particular since the Social Democratic Party Congress clearly made uh, a statement on what the observer position is all about. The idea is for Sweden to join the ban Kerstin Lundgren should, of course, realize this and show that the Centre Party dares to stand up for the stance adopted by the party. Thank you. Thank you. Finally rejoined her. Mr. Speaker, now things are uh, somewhat odd, I have to say. Tomorrow we are going to formulate a view of the committee on a number of uh, motions, uh, proposals uh, from for example, Christian Democrats' own initiative proposals. And we expect that we'll have clarity in her committee and also clear opinion in the parliament as such to clarify what uh, the parliament position is. It's not about what the Social Democrats have said at their Congress. It is about what the parliament thinks. And I expect that we'll have something very clear from committee and uh, that is at least what is necessary for us uh, to be on board. Thank you. And uh, we continue with uh, the next set of rejoinders, and you are for sale from the Liberal Party. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Kerstin Lundgren, for uh, uh, an overall excellent address. I have two questions. The first one deals with Taiwan. The member uh, mentioned Taiwan in her address, however, a little bit less underlined than uh, the address uh, Shoshin Lundgren gave last year. Back then, she explained more how you'd like to deepen and strengthen and develop the, our relations with Taiwan. Today, Mr. Speaker, the uh, Independence Day of Lithuania is celebrated. A country leading the way in foreign policy, Kerstin Lundgren, in her address, mentioned that the Centre Party would like to see more focus on democracy in foreign policy. The Liberal Party shares that view with the Centre Party. We'd also um, similarly like Sweden to follow in the footsteps of Lithuania to uh, introduce a values-based foreign policy. In the case of Lithuania, this has meant, amongst other things, deepened ties with um, Taiwan in spite of the fact that it has made China upset. So my question to Kerstin Lundgren is whether you would also like to see uh, Sweden following the example of Lithuania to have a values-based foreign policy. My second question has to do with the responsibility under solidarity that Sweden took it upon themselves in relation to the Baltic states in the area of energy policy when the Baltic states j joined the EU. If you read about the events back then, Sweden made a commitment to ensure that those countries would not become reliant on Russian energy for the purposes of energy uh, production or consumption. They would be able to avail themselves of a Swedish offering, but that's not 
uh, available right now. I think that we believe more nuclear to deliver on the promise we've made to the Baltic states. Does Justin Lundgren have another plan for how to cope with this re- obligation of solidarity? Nadia. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As regards Taiwan, we firmly stand by the view that we presented last year. Uh, we've also, in motions, actually demanded that Taiwan uh, needs to be we all rather we need to upgrade a business Sweden to House of Sweden, in fact, in order to clarify the fact that we have a very close re- relationship with uh, Taiwan. We've also been uh, very positive uh, to the idea of free trade agreements with Taiwan. So absolutely, we support Taiwan and we also hope to visit Taiwan later this spring. Now, Lithuania, apart from the fact that uh, today is their Independence Day. Oh, we'll be celebrating that uh, uh, later. Uh, but Lit- Lithuania is making a very important contribution. And here in Sweden, we need to be clear uh, that we actually support our cooperation with Lithuania there and not just say that, well, Lithuania is a small country that are doing their own thing. No, I think it's important that we uh, join forces for democracy uh, and a, de- a sort of to take action for democracy, which is what Lithuania is actually doing, which is value based. It's about human rights. It's about freedoms. It's about liberal fundamental values. That's how we should see that. And as regards the issue of energy, now for us, for the Centre Party, the cable from Sweden to the Baltic states has, of course, been a very important part of that solidarity naturally i mean we have excess a surplus of energy and electricity we that we export and we need to do that going forward too regardless of we're talking about hydroelectric nuclear power wind power what have you uh, i do hope that the liberal parties that you don't take over this when it comes to nuclear power that you don't see the forest for all, the wood for all the forest, the trees Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Liberals would also like to see a mix of all fossil-free uh, energy types, hydro, wind, etc. Nothing strange about that. However, that we would have an excess supply is a bit of an exaggeration, possibly. It's like saying that we have an excess of housing in Sweden. However, it's impossible to find somewhere to live in Stockholm. The ele- Electricity needs to be available when and where you need it, and we do not always have sufficient uh, capacity available. And that is uh, some cause for concern when it comes to the obligation of solidarity to the Baltic states. So I wonder if um, Justin Lundgren, similarly to a number of other members of this House, would like to condemn the aggressions by China in relation to Taiwan. I'm thinking in particular when they fly aircraft uh, over Taiwan territory. Thank you, Speaker. Well, it's about the fact that it has to, I mean, the the cable to the Baltic state was important because the energy has to get there, obviously. And then there's also important for the continent because we do want to ensure that we have an energy market that actually works. And naturally, it's also important that we have this transmission capacity within the country and there that's where the risk lies which is where we need to well what we need to deal with however mrs speaker and we have examples of not just hydroelectric but also wind power renewable power where we have i mean huge expansion plans many want to invest in that and that's also possible to transit that kind of energy to other countries however mrs speaker as regards condemning china uh, and its actions and uh, aggression vis-à-vis Taiwan and its territory, then, of course, naturally, yes, we do believe we need to ensure that uh, we protect Taiwan and its region. Thank you. That's the end of that round of regi- uh, rejoinders. Now we have the go-go back to the speaker's list. Håkan Svenneling next from the left party, please. Mr. Speaker, during Erdogan's 
Rain. The development in Turkey has taken clear steps in the wrong direction since the failed coup attempt in summer 2016. Restrictions of democratic free and freedom and rights have increased exponentially. Mass arrests and restrictions of freedom of expression have been recurring features. Turkey has pulled out of the Istanbul Convention, banning violence against women. President Erdogan has a never more reactionary approach to women's rights. Women should stay at home and have many children. And of course, Erdogan has also said that there are no LGBTQ persons in Turkey. The political opposition has been under heavy oppression, in particular the pro-Kurdic opposition party HPD. They are attacked on a daily basis. HDP is the third largest party in Turkish parliament. In spite of this, the Turkish state prosecutor is, even as we speak, it trying to uh, ban them from existing as a particular party, entirely in breach of democratic principles. Arrests of political representatives of HDP, HDP has uh, reached uh, startling numbers, uh, uh, thousands. Immunity is uh, waived so that uh, uh, parliamentarians can be tried and sentenced to be quiet. In uh, one legal case in the Kobani case, 108 people were uh, tried uh, and prosecuted for having encouraged people to protest against Turkey's, uh, Turkish involvement in the terror group IS attack against Koban and sentence is expected soon. Over and over again, the uh, European court uh, of human rights has confirmed that Turkey is in breach of the European Convention two weeks ago. The court found that it was incorrect to waive immunity for parliamentarians. It's in violation of Article 10 of the conventions. Nevertheless, the regime continues to be in breach over and over again. In foreign policy, Turkey has been very active in creating and getting involved in different conflicts. Only last week, the foreign minister alleged that Greek islands should belong to Turkey. And recently, there were reports presented that chemical weapons had been used in northern Iraq by the Turkish military. Reports which need uh, to be confirmed by independent international bodies such as OPCW. Two weeks ago, Turkey bombed uh, made bombardments in Kurdish areas in both Iraq and Syria. Refugee camps were hit. This could be, unfortunately, the beginning of yet another Turkish invasion. In October 2019, the left party saw an important sharpening of the Turkey policy in Sweden when all parties in the Riksdag uh, voted in favour of the left party and liberal proposal to stop arms export to Turkey. This meant that two confirmed deals were stopped and a number, unknown number of in initiated processes had to be concluded. This was uh, something which caused great annoyance in uh, Turkey. This new stance by Sweden and uh, it likely led to uh, that Sweden um, straightened up its re rhetorics when it comes to other crimes against human rights. Turkey applied for EU membership in 1986 and is the country that has waited the longest to exceed. It received status as a candidate country in 1999. However, membership negotiations were only begun in 2005. Sweden used to be a driver to allow Turkey to negotiate. But today, we are rather one of the most vociferous critics of uh, the development in the country within the EU. As part of the membership negotiations, Turkey receives pre-accession support of several billion euro in IPA. The uh, refugee agreement also gives Turkey six billion Euro. The European Investment Bank has extensive investments in the country ever uh, since 1965. For a long time, the left party has criticized the development in Turkey and has encouraged Sweden and the EU to act more forcefully. The EU has not had the courage to act against Turkey for fear of Erdogan uh, uh, reneging on the shameful agreement which prevents refugees from uh, getting from Turkey to Europe. And this is why the left party today believes that the Swedish policies against Turkey need to be sharpened further. Negotiations and money must be frozen entirely and if there is no change to the shrinking democratic uh, room to maneuver it should be called off entirely. Turkey is also the second largest member of the military alliance NATO however hardly a very reliable member recently they opted to purchase Russian weapon systems this is the Turkey that the Swedish right-wing parties are objecting um, uh, and claiming uh, to the heavens that we would be safer if we were in the same NATO bed as them if and speaking of dependence on others, Europe's need of, for Russian gas has increased in a worrying way, not just countries such as uh, Germany and Poland, but also Sweden. Vattenfall, the company, imports Russian uranium to our nuclear power plants and uh, from Putin's company Rosatom and the government would like Swedish electricity prices to be determined by the price of Russian gas when we uh, join the so-called European energy market and either the right-wing governments or social democratic governments have done enough to stop the construction of Nord Stream in, uh, Nord Stream in our economic zone. Sweden is not dependent of Russian, on Russian gas uh, supply but the government has made our um, electricity market entirely price dependent on Russian gas.
without any security policy discussion whatsoever. In reality, this is just as forceful a Russian weapon as being able to turn off gas, gas taps. If we want to protect our sovereignty, public control of essential infrastructure is decisive for a total defence. Some now clamour that Sweden should send more weapons to this and that place. That's never going to make neither us or our world a more safe and secure world. There are already far too many Swedish weapons used in wars and conflicts across the globe. In particular, in Yemen, where thousands of children are uh, affected by both violence and hunger, displaying Reuterswerd's well-known peace statue with the tied-up gun at the World Expo in Dubai simply doesn't work when the United Arab Emirates at the same time is the number one recipient of Swedish arms exports. This is perhaps why the feminist foreign policy no longer makes the cut in Prime Minister Magdalena Andersson's declaration of government. Rather, it is the safeguarding of our military non-alignment which creates the security both for us and the world around us. We have an excellent military cooperation with Finland which we want to safeguard and deepen. Some also call for the US and the so-called transatlantic link, saying that this is a solution. But bear in mind that the US also has an energy dependence from of Russia, and the US solution to Europe's energy challenge is more reliant on uh, in sustain, unsustainable gas from countries such as Qatar and the US. It's not climate transition. And the first year as president for, has been so-so for Joe Biden's weak leadership when Israel bombed Gaza yet again, chaos when they left Afghanistan, putting many Swedes in the way of danger and harm and cost many Afghans their life. And at the climate summit in Glasgow, they accepted watered down wordings from climate deniers. Mr. Speaker, it's through climate transition that we can do something truly positive to stop civil threats to climate, uh, from climate change, but also for a better, more just world. If we stop dependency on oil and gas uh, dependence, we stop feeding Gulf dictatorships, buying both sports events and weapons. Uh, uh, or large powers with military ambition, both in the South China Sea and in our immediate uh, vicinity. For the wealthy of the world, the situation is excellent. The pandemic hit hard against the economy for 99% of the world's population, but Jeff Bezos and his 10 uh, uh, closest old guy friends doubled their wealth, according to Oxfam. Our problem is not our wealth, but rather how the wealth is distributed. It's time that we change our world, if we mean uh, what we say when we say that we want to stop this global pandemic and the global climate change situation. Thank you. Thank you. Minister for Foreign Affairs and Social Democrats, Hans Wallmark, Kerstin Lundgren, Lars Adaktusson, and you are for sale, uh, have requested rejoinders. Minister, Madam Minister, first, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Now, the regime in Venezuela has led to a very difficult crisis, forcing six million people to flee the country. Together with the contact group for Venezuela, the EU and the United Nations, Sweden is continuing working to try to find an, a solution to Venezuela and a return to democratic order. Free, uh, and, uh, free elections, for example, presidential elections. And we therefore see, or we see the uh, the way the um, powers that be there act and oppress and persecute journalists and people working for uh, democracies. So Sweden continues to support Guaido and before democratic order is resumed with free elections. So my question to the left party is why can't the left party support this work? Thank you. Mr. Speaker, the political crisis in Venezuela has been ongoing for uh, three years now. I'm very concerned by the fact that it's such a long period. It's hit the population very hard. Those responsible are, in particular, President Maduro, who, through his actions, created divisions in his country, which has... Uh, created economic difficulties to make the population suffer. But he didn't support the government's work because Juan Guaido was recognized. He uh, unilaterally declared himself pres president in spite of not having popular support or having been elected. 
And the problem with the policies of this government is that sanctions have hit uh, the population very hard. And only a week and a half ago, there was a UN report on how sanctions hit women, children, healthcare workers, and people with disabilities are particularly hard hit, and how the those living in poverty and indigenous population groups are hit the hardest as well. The Venezuelan people suffer the most. So we need to show our support and solidarity. And there are some positive signs in Venezuela right now. Negotiations are back on the table and Maduro in particular managed to comply with democracy and democratic requirements in regional and local election. And even in the region where Hugo Chavez got his votes, the opposition was permitted to uh, take uh, uh, control through the elections. There has to be a difference between choosing between uh, Maduro and Guaido. I would have preferred if the line had been drawn by the uh, government. Unfortunately, the recognition provided only extended the period of crisis. We're in the third year right now with a fourth year looming and the people in uh, Venezuela have, are suffering as a result, both under their own reign and due to all the sanctions from the world around it. Thank you, Minister. You have the floor. Um, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Hawkins Felling, you question the legitimacy of Juan Guaido, and let me just say that the National Assembly that was elected in 2015 was electorally elected, uh, and and Juan Guaido did he was declared as an interim president through a democratic procedure, and thus he gained democratic legitimacy. The opposition then extended on the 5th January 2022 uh, his mandate for a further year. And so Sweden continues to support Guaido and other actors in Venezuela trying to work to return to uh, democratic order to uh, free elections. And I have planned uh, contact with Guaido next week, and I would hope that the left party had a different view on this. Re rejoinder, please. Mr. Speaker, we never questioned the election of the National Assembly, but we quest did question the presidential election in 2018, where Maduro had additional mandates. But Maduro was elected correctly, uh, however, in 2014, and that tends to be forgotten about. I wonder if the Minister for Foreign Affairs is pleased with the development in Venezuela, the fact that we're standing here and that there is still a political crisis ongoing in Venezuela. Sweden has been a part of the International Contact Group. We've said that we care of uh, and for the Venezuelan people. We want to show solidarity, but really it's all a matter of uh, dancing to the U.S. tune. And the, uh, all these recognitions of Guaido, who is he? He was elected with fewer votes than the Liberal Party to the Swedish, government, uh, Swedish Parliament with fewer votes. He does not have public support. He was the Speaker of the National Assembly, but that does not make him an obvious uh, automatic uh, new candidate for president. The opposition has left uh, it all behind him. It's only the West who are sticking uh, to their guns and this person. I think they should stop doing that. Thank you. This concludes this round of rejoinders. Hans Wallmark has the floor for the next round of rejoinders. Mr. Speaker, I think it was a, a very good round of rejoinders and a brilliant question, an adequate question posed by the Foreign Minister to the Left Party. And to the Left Party, uh, just as I said to the Sweden Democrats earlier, I think that you need to... Uh, I mean, we have to complain about certain stances taken and, and your response to Venez about Venezuela does, in fact... Uh, I would say, mean that you need to go home and do your homework. Uh, similarly, with regard to Ukraine, now, if Ukraine is attacked, uh, there's a war, uh, as it were, against Ukraine, above and beyond what we've already seen with the annexation of Crimea, I think the rest of the world we needs to, to sit down and think about how we can support Ukraine in every possible way. Now, the Left Party did tell the Sweden Democrats to talk to their parliamentarian, European parliamentarians, and I'm just telling the Left Party to talk to their party group in the European Parliament, actually, because Marlene Björk normally quite often makes the right decision, but the party group with communists and all sorts, 
really. They didn't vote or voted against the package yesterday. And the truth of the matter is, Mr. Speaker, the left party is standing on the same side as the uh, Sweden Democrats when it comes to party groups in the European Parliament. There, I think, is definitely room for Im improvement, Mr. Speaker. Håkan Svenning, please. Um, yeah, yeah. Mr. Speaker, I agree with Hans Wallmark. I'm not proud of several the, of the previous representatives of the left party in the uh, committee. In the Danish Enhetslistan and some of our other sibling uh, parties in uh, uh, the Nordics, we've taken initiative to uh, have replacements made to the Euro uh, committee in the European Parliament. The European Parliament is not good at uh, foreign policy. They end up in the wrong positions. But now we have Malin Björk. But the question is, uh, the situation is as it is. When uh, the European Parliament is uh, reforming its committees, we want to have a representative there uh, who truly represent us with uh, independent mandates from half-crazed Irishmen and what have you. Uh, I want to correct you on the vote. There were uh, more representatives of the ECR group that the Swedish Democrats, Sweden Democrats belong to who voted in favour of Putin's regime by, so to speak, vote against or abstain on the resolution on uh, can I had been in touch with Malin Björk uh, excellent uh, contacts we uh, had clarified that this was all about financial support to Ukraine and I believe that that is very important right now because the war that has been raging since 2014 that's a long time after all it could continue for another number of years so a stable and strong financially functioning and democratic Ukraine is much stronger uh, based on uh, their needs for resilience and support from the population so that the hybrid attacks from Russia cannot gain a foothold. We need to support Ukraine. I do not believe in the military proposals to try and, and delve through our uh, inventories to find old uniforms to send to Ukraine. I don't think that's going to benefit neither them nor us. Thank you. Hans Wallmark. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The difference between the moderate party and the left party is that we do see the extensive threat against Ukraine, and therefore you need to use all your resources. And I think it's good that Hawkins Svelling does take a, a or distance himself from the the party group in the European Parliament. I think that's very that's very praiseworthy. And I can praise you further in that Svelling, you a couple of foreign debates ago, you did in fact stretch out a hand about uh, David Isak and Gwyn Minhau here. We've got lots of support in this Riksdag as well for that cooperation. Finally, just a question. Now, you do want to become part of a, gov the government, a government with the Social Democrats. Now, how does that work with your view on the memorandum of um, understanding cooperation with NATO, no NATO ambassador in Brussels, etc.? A question to you, therefore, is... What is the left party going to demand to become a part of the government together with the Green Party and the Social Democrats? Please. Yeah, they were Mr. Speaker, that was an interesting question. If the moderate party now believes that the left will win the election September 11th so that we can be part of forming a government, well, I hope that will happen. And it is pleasing to hear that uh, Hans Wallmark could think so as well. And we'll have to get back to where we'll have our support. But of course, the differences in our ideas about security policy, us and the Social Democrats, but there are good experiences from neighboring countries. And of course, well, we have to agree in order to be part of um, a government. And one requirement might be that we're going to work actively for nuclear disarmament globally. Uh, thank you. That concludes uh, that set of rejoinders. And we continue with the next and Kerstin Lundgren. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm curious. The left party, do you support the security policy of solidarity, the unique uh, Swedish solidarity declaration that if an EU Nordic country is attacked by Russia, Sweden will not remain neutral? 
left the left party what's your view and i'd also like to hear whether you the left party believes that uh, the eu is the most important security policy arena for sweden and i'm also naturally very interested to hear i mean this we i mean we've been discussing non alignment before in previous debates now apart from the left party and the social democrats and the green party who believes that the that uh, non alignment leads to stability and i did hear putin on the 17th of december uh, who did say very clearly that from the kremlin said that it would roll back nato to where we were in 1997 that was their policy that's what kremlin wants to achieve is that also something that the left party wants to push for to achieve that to achieve peace and stability because nato and military non alignment th obviously threaten or nato is a threat and non alignment gives security stability peace in our part of the world, uh, world. reply please mr speaker many questions let's see if i can manage uh, them all uh, the uh, solidarity that you refer to well we have it in the lisbon treaty for example 427 and the left uh, was against uh, the lisbon treaty because it gives uh, m the eu more supranational powers but we do think that we should be solidaric towards the nordic countries primarily and uh, if uh, any of those Nordic countries end up in conflict, war, or suffer from a uh, natural disaster, well, then we should help. We also have a responsibility towards the rest of Europe, but it hasn't been expressed th that way. And it's also kind of unclear when it comes to this wording in the Lisbon Treaty. <clears throat> but uh, no, the EU is not the most important foreign policy arena for Sweden. The UN, the United Nations, should be. That is where we should agree with other countries, because there we have the entire world. And I do think, obviously, that there is too much focus on the EU. And the, that means we have a foreign policy in Sweden where we do not care enough about Africa, Latin America, and big parts of Asia. But uh, there's just too much Europe in Swedish foreign policy. And I do belong believe that non-alignment has served us well, because we have had 200 years without uh, war, and I do think that the Swedish population is very happy with that fact. And then when it comes to NATO and uh, Warsaw Pact, if you want, and uh, the Russia uh, newly awakened interest in the Warsaw Pact. Well, it's about the failures of the 90s and the beginning of um, <clears throat> this millennium because the Warsaw Pact was dissolved and we should have done the same with NATO. Please. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This becomes very interesting because, firstly, I hear that the left party does not see the EU as Sweden's most important security policy arena, foreign, security foreign policy arena. That's worth noting for most, many of us, I think. And I also heard here that the unique solidarity clause, I didn't get a response. I heard a reference to the Lisbon agreement, uh, Lisbon treaty that the left party was against. Hmm. But... Nothing about our position here in the Riksdag from 2009, which is our foreign policy, which states that if a conflict crisis occurs in one of our Nordic neighbours or within the, a country within the EU, the Sweden will not remain passive. So, the left party, what's your stance? Response, please. Yeah, I man, you Mr. Speaker, I thought I answered the question and that I was quite clear, just as we did when we have the def had the defense decision. We still support that line that Sweden should help out. But many right-wing politicians, they uh, draw a line between NATO, Article 224, well, I can't remember what article, but anyway, between the NATO 
Agreement and uh, the Lisbon Treaty and 42.7, a crisis, uh, that's one thing, and a war is another thing altogether. And the Swedish non-alignment has served us well. And then, on the other hand, and I've said this already, we do think that a defense collaboration with Finland is good. We should uh, cherish that and deepen it. Thank you. Uh, thank you. That concludes that set of rejoinders. And we continue with uh, Lars Adaktusson from the Christian Democrats. Mr. Speaker, in the wake of a more autocratic Russia, there is political unity that Swedish defense needs to be reinforced and cooperation with other democracies and with NATO needs to be increase. And the left party, you, as we've heard, just heard, has a different view. And their view seems to be that the United Nations and Finland, they sh will help Sweden when there's a, a military attack. Now, Mr. Speaker, this really is far removed from reality. It's naive. But not only that, to stop all cooperation with NATO, as you wish, would be irresponsible. And it would undermine our military abilities. It would destroy the possibility of uh, defending Sweden in the long term. I'm not claiming here that the left party in this way wants to play into the hands of Moscow. Still, that is exactly what uh, the party is doing, Håkan Svelling. And it's just as bad when Håkan Svelling in a article in the newspaper GP says that cooperation within NATO leads to increased tension in our region. And this word wording could be taken from the Russian troll factories sh and show that the left party can't distinguish between right and wrong. The responsibility for the most Im the, the biggest uh, security crisis, policy crisis in Europe does not lie on the states that want to cooperate with the Western alliance, defense alliance, is what that responsibility lies 100% with Moscow. Say that very clearly, please, Hawkins Felling. Mm, Mr. Speaker, I have to uh, correct uh, Lars Akhtusson. He claimed that, that we want to increase uh, the Swedish defense uh, budget. And uh, this is actually something we have been working for for a long time. But then uh, to not listen to the Supreme Commander, well, that is a problem, I would say. He talks about how it's unlikely that there will be a military attack on Sweden. That is what we hear from the Supreme Commander time and time again, and that is what the left party believes as well. It's very unlikely that there will be a military attack on Sweden. But you're right. It is Putin and Kreml, that regime, that is responsible for the security policy situation and the deterioration that we see today. But it is important to remember that Russia always wants us to be in that state of insecurity. And there is no magical solution. There is no magic wand or formula that we can use to solve all these problems, because Russia, they like that gray zone. And we will be there for a long time, as long as Putin is in power in Russia. And that is why we need to support the democratic opposition, the real opposition in Russia. That is not to be found in any parties today, because political parties are being shut down by Putin. We have to support the activists that fight for another Russia, and that would make our neighboring area more secure with a democratic Russia. And this is the problem with NATO, and you've also talked about that in this um, article. NATO contributes to increased tension because uh, we see more troops in Norway, more American soldiers in Denmark is another wish, and that contributes to deterioration of the security situation in our neighborhood. And that is what I'm against, and that is why I'm against a NATO membership. 
leadership and that we approach NATO. Lord Sedakteson. Mr. Speaker, and authoritarian threatening power in Moscow, uh, rearmament we haven't seen for decades. This requires realistic analyses and taking responsibility. Now, what you, Hokan Spelling, are saying, this is just a long list of uh, far, uh, far removed from reality. The left party's security political views from is very, very low and has been from the communist days and even worse now when we can see the way the party has acted in recent months. Mr. Speaker, that's not just unfortunate, it is very bad indeed. Final response from uh, Hawke Anthony. Mr. Speaker, our security policy line has been clear for a long time. We say that Russia is a security policy threat. But there are many people in Russia who are against the regime, who do not fit in that society Putin wants to build, be it that you're an environmentalist, LBTQI, or something else. They live under daily security threat. Last year, we saw Memorial Real being dissolved. We see cheating in elections to Duma, and we see poisonings and work camps. And Russia also has an imperialistic policy, and that is a threat towards neighboring countries countries, Ukraine, Moldavia, Georgia, and countries in Central Asia. We have seen many examples in the last few years. And in addition, this is also a security policy threat against us, but it's unlikely that we'll see an attack in Sweden. That uh, concludes uh, that set of rejoinders, and we continue with your Forsell from the Liberal Party. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to Håkan Svelling. Now, let me start. I've got three questions. Let me start with the first question on Ukraine, where the left party, as a party, your members supported the financial package uh, that was voted on yesterday in the European Parliament, which is positive in itself. However, you here say, Mr. Svelling, that the left party is against helping Ukraine in the ways that they might need, for example, with weapons. There is the export of weapons that you are against, mainly. Now, I see one path or one route forward that if we can see that the Swedish legislation doesn't mean that we are able to sell weapons, instead we could help Ukraine with financial means so that they are able to buy weapons. That would be one way of circumventing this problem and issue. And so I'm wondering whether the left party within or in the Swedish Riksdag would support such a proposal. So giving them funds to be able to buy weapons. Then, Mr. Speaker, it is the case that the left party often talks about poverty in the world, which we sh and this is uh, something that we are worried that we share. And I think one of the best ways to do that is uh, through ownership and trade, free trade. Now, the left party, you're against or different free trade agreements that are discussed. But I'm wondering here, what new free trade ag agreements would you like to see to help people to get out of poverty. My third question is with regard to do with your round of rejoinders with the Centre Party. You said that the NATO, that NATO should have been dissolved just like the Warsaw Pact, which I think is rather astonishing in many ways. But what other organisations do you think should be dissolved? The EU, the WTO, the World Trade Agri uh, Organization. Uh, who should we dissolve, or what organisations rather? Response, please. Mr. Speaker, many questions from your Fursell. When it comes to Ukraine, I think it serves us well uh, to be strict when it comes to weapons export, because after all, we want to have a world without weapons. And, uh, well, that is a good goal, albeit the journey is long until we get there. But it's very different from what the Liberal Party feels, because whenever there's a crisis, you want to send a JAS fighter plane. And uh, 
I do not think that we should try to circumvent the legislation we have on exports of weapons. We should use the legislation we have. And if a country is at war, and that is the case with Russia and Ukraine since 2014, that is quite an obstacle. And then when it comes to poverty, trade is important to counteract poverty. And what has been a problem is that we have injustices in many of the trade agreements that we've had. And we also have the possibility for companies to sue states. And that has been negative for many developing countries. But we have free trade agreements, the good examples when it comes to creating development, for example, in the African continent. Although we have uh, in the trade agreements that EU has been involved with some type of neo-colonialism. And then uh, NATO and my opinion that uh, it should be dissolved. Well, I don't think that that will happen just because we write it. But I think this is the only organization we think we should do away with. And I think you should look at our party program. That is a hint towards the 1990s and what happened with the Warsaw Pact, because then we were discussing disarmament. We are not doing that now, but we need to get to such a situation again where we talk about disarmament. And when we do that together. Thank you. But Mr. Speaker, it seems as if the security order in Europe, every country has the right to determine its own security order and security policy. Uh, then it's very odd that the left party that you are against, that we can't give financial support if it's, that money is going to be used to buy weapons. I mean, yesterday you voted in favor of financial package to support Ukraine. And then what happens if they use that those funds to buy weapons? Then I do hope that the left party won't sort of retreat and, and not support that form of support. Because it's all about supporting uh, Ukraine as well as the European security order. If you don't support Ukraine, you support the Kremlin. Perhaps not strange that we disagree on NATO, but you didn't say anything about new uh, or other organizations or new free trade agreements. I'm not sure I have time to answer uh, that question. But let me start by saying that the most important thing is that we have a stable Ukraine to have resilience. And we know uh, that, uh, well, we've, since we heard that there is a threat against foreign invention, uh, invasion, then we have said that foreign investment has disappeared. Sweden has not pulled out. We have rather contributed with increased support. And that is also what we've seen from the EU. And I think that is incredibly important. And uh, I also think that there is a need for democratic reform, counteracting corruption, etc. But the problem with Sweden arms is that they appear here and there in different countries also where we have a UN weapons embargo. And uh, <laughs> not to talk about how we do what we do to just, uh, well, bomb a country and then realize that there is still a problem 10 years later. And that is the problem. Uh, thank you. And that concludes that set of rejoinders. Uh, oh. And uh, we continue with the speaker's list, and uh, we continue with Lars Adaktusson from the Christian Democrats. Herr Talman, vi sidan av... Mr. Speaker, we have China and Iran, and in addition, we have Russia being the most serious threat against uh, international security. What uh, Putin and his regime can do? Well, there is no doubt we see that with clarity, frightening clarity in these days. And we've seen the same before the attack on Georgia in 2008, the murders in eastern Ukraine, the annexation of uh, Crimea in 2014. That was the start of uh, this shameless uh, policy of conquering other countries, what we see today. And with this military buildup and the threats against Ukraine, the Russian regime want to erode the European security order and uh, show an example. An independent state should be oppressed, and uh, the right that a nation should have to themselves decide about belonging, that should uh, be uh, done away with. 
one is that there should be a Russian sphere of interest. And Putin makes no secret of the fact that he wants to weaken the EU. He wants to ensure that other countries are not entering into collaborations, and he wants to continue building his empire. Mr. Speaker, military buildups and troops uh, that are now around Ukraine well, that is not a limited threat. Russia is threatening Europe in its entirety. And that is why it's so important that responsibility for this is placed where it belongs. And that is with uh, the uh, criminals that we have in Kreml. And it is also very, very important that the member states in the European Union and in NATO remain uh, consistent in condemning what is happening and in supporting Ukraine with the defense materials, defensive weapons, if possible, and also with the uh, financial and humanitarian aid. If there is any time where the EU member countries should speak with one voice in foreign policy, it is now. And if there is one single time where words should be followed by action, it is when our common security is being threatened. The Christian Democrats has, on several occasions, welcomed the bilateral collaborations we have uh, with Finland, with the United States, and with the United Kingdom. And we've also stressed the fact that uh, a guarantee to get help from abroad if there is a military attack, that we can only get if we're full members of NATO. And for this reason and for other reasons as well, Sweden should have, have been um, a member of NATO a long time ago. The Social Democrats haven't been able to, and uh, that has blocked uh, this membership. And uh, the government says that the NATO membership would create uncertainty, that it would change the security policy doctrine. but. It's actually the opposite to that it a fact. A membership would make things clearer. And it would also give us guarantees about assistance from the outside. That the government is prior prioritizing avoiding arguments within the party, well, that is not necessary and potentially foolish. Mr. Speaker. We have Russia, but then we also have the developments in the People's Republics of China that is worrying. Political decisions have been made, and the Communist Party is getting more power. But we see deteriorations when it comes to democracy, human values, and also financial reform. Lately, we see that people are being persecuted because of re religion, Christians, uh, Muslims. Uh, we have Uyghurs in the Xiang province being brainwashed and imprisoned. And we see the same in Hong Kong, where people are being imprisoned followed uh, using the China security laws. And in Taiwan, independent Taiwan, we see democracy being threatened by what the Peking regime is doing and a threat of war. In parallel, we also see uh, the global appetite growing from the regime. High investments are made in technology, for example, in order to strengthen the power of the Communist Party. Mr. Speaker, in the Middle East, we have Iran that uh, is a destructive, destabilizing factor. We see that in Yemen, in Syria, in Lebanon, and also in Iraq. We see it in dictatorship, regime, support to jihadists, terrorists, and we also see this in the threats to make Israel and the Jewish people extinct. And not the least for that reason, Israel needs our support. The Christian Democrats welcome the improved bilateral relationships between Sweden and Israel. And at the same time, we stress the importance of seven lost years in our relationship now. Well, they have to be followed by action. And this could be done through an active Swedish commitment 
for the Abraham agreements and also in order to move by moving the Swedish embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem because that is the capital of Israel. Mr. Speaker, recently the organization Open Doors published its yearly compilation of uh, where it's most difficult to live as a Christian. We have 2.3 billion Christians in the world today, and 300 million can not freely practice their faith. And this was a more limited problem, but now we see that uh, Christians are being persecuted in Mexico, Indonesia, India. We see abuse as we speak. And the government and the government reaction to this is uh, that they show no interest whatsoever. They couldn't be bothered. In the foreign policy declaration, freedom of religion is not mentioned, and uh, we see no political proposals. And that is exactly what the situation has been for many years. In addition, we also have uh, the refusal uh, to uh, admit uh, the Armenian genocide and the genocide we saw in 2014 on Syrians. And, and Linda, this is a betrayal. This is a betrayal towards the Christian indigenous populations, and it is a mistake to keep quiet. Silence is an encouragement for the oppressor, not the one who is being oppressed. And uh, that is uh, an insight that makes me call on the government and the foreign minister to do something. Thank you. And the following have asked for rejoinders. I'm Linda from the Social Democrats uh, and the Håkan Svenning from the Left Party. And we begin with the foreign minister. Thank you, Talman. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Generous aid is needed in the world characterized by the COVID-19 pandemic with democracy issues and climate issues hitting people who are the most vulnerable hardest. The UN level is not a ceiling, but rather something all countries can strive towards reaching, including our neighboring country, Norway. 2020 reached more than 1% of their GDR. Our international solidarity gives us respect and influence. Several international organizations emphasize Sweden's contributions as vital for their activities. How does the Christian Democrats plan to ensure that we meet the 1% target in a cooperation on the right wing with the moderate party and the Sweden Democrats who would like to make drastic cuts? Lars Adaptesson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As uh, the foreign minister knows, the Christian Democrats is uh, a party that is uh, committed and involved in international aid. This has been one of uh, our most important uh, questions throughout uh, all of our existence. And uh, we stand behind international solidarity, where we are s show solidarity with those who are poor, and uh, vulnerable. And we show solidarity towards those who, for whatever reason, need a helping hand. And there are no proposals whatsoever within our party to change this. It's rather the opposite, I think, that the support for our foreign aid policy within the party is stronger today than it's been before. And we have no intention whatsoever to abandon that position. And when it comes to what will happen in possible negotiations that might happen in the future, well, of course, I cannot say anything about that today. What we know is that in those contacts that we've had up until today, uh, between the Sweden Democrats, the moderates, and the Christian Democrats, we've had understanding for our opinion, and we've also been successful in maintaining uh, the 1% objective in those talks. Thank you. 
Thank you, Foreign Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This is precisely why I raised this issue, because I know how involved the Christian Democrats and various members of your party across the country uh, are. And I owe them every, we owe them every respect for being so committed to these issues. That's why I wanted to address it. And I wonder if uh, Lord Dacuson can promise that Christian Democrats won't vo vote in favor of a budget that abandons the 1% target. Lord Dacuson? I told my mayor. Mr. Speaker, thank you to the Foreign Minister for well, giving me that confidence. And she obviously believes that I can uh, present such an ultimatum on behalf of my political party. I do not have that position. I don't think that any one single representative of the Christian Democrats can make any guarantees prior to possible negotiations on forming a government. But we are clear in where we stand, and uh, that you know, and you Social Democrats, you also know that we in this uh, parliament are prepared to fight for the 1% objective. And we have been clear in what we have done, not least during this uh, mandate period. Uh, thank you. That concludes that uh, set of rejoinders, and we continue with Håkan Svenneling from the left party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If we uh, comply with uh, Lars Wallmark, I think you should consider Gudrun Bunegård and Jakob and Jakob Forsmed and uh, Rektorsson. There are so many Forsells here, uh, so I get the names wrong. Uh, you stood up for the 1% uh, objective in the budget, which unfortunately gained the support of the Riksdag, but at least it was good for the public. Aim. Now, two matters where we don't agree. Most of us would like to achieve a world free of nuclear threats, including the five nuclear states, referred to as P5, made a statement at the beginning of January that a nuclear war could never be won, uh, only need to the destruction of this earth. But that doesn't appear to apply for the Christian Democrats. On the contrary, you are upset that the, government's inten the government intends to go as an observer to the meeting on the UN. A nuclear convention, which has been signed by 59 countries the world over Sweden, is far from the only country to be an observer, even if we unfortunately didn't sign the convention. Norway is doing the same, and Finland, Germany, and Switzerland as well. But the Christian Democrats have tabled a committee initiative to try and prevent Swedish participation, but you will likely lose out tomorrow in the committee meeting. But the so-called P5 are not the only countries who have nuclear weapons. We often hear Lars Adaktusson point out, and rightly so, with concern of the uh, nuclear arsenal of North Korea and Iran's attempt to try and get it, but he tends to forget another country which has uh, counteracted the implementation of a nuclear zone for a long time in the Middle East, Israel. Or, as Lars Adaktusson often points out, the only democracy in the Middle East. But the Israeli politics is not terribly uh, democratic, at least not against Palestinians. Another human rights organization, Amnesty, has determined that Israel divides people according to apartheid principles, both when it comes to Palestinians in occupied Palestine and Palestinians with Israeli uh, citizenship in Israel, according to Amnesty. Amnesty requires, therefore, that the International Criminal Court should investigate the crimes and hold the, those responsible accountable. Why does Lars Adaptus on defend Israel's nuclear weapons. Mr. Speaker, Israel is not a perfect country. Just uh, as uh, we could criticize uh, Swedish actions, uh, we could also criticize uh, some things that Israel does. But uh, the amnesty report is not a good basis for, basis for serious criticism. It's incomplete, it's imbalanced, and it's rather one description of what one party feels. And uh, um, the Israel is being described as a very, uh, in a very skewed way. And how can an organization this way disregard the legitimate needs of Israel to be safe and secure? Israel is surrounded by dictatorships and the regimes that wouldn't want to see anything rather than make Israel and the Jews population extinct. And how can Amnesty disregard this fact that there are facts and facts showing that uh, this uh, minority doesn't want to leave Israel because uh, their situation there is much better than it would be elsewhere in the Middle East. There are many 
like uh, Hawkan uh, swindling and uh, amnesty are attacking Israel because it's a Jewish state. But that was one of the main purposes with the, the plan of the UN in 1947. And uh, that was a plan that Israel suggests to, in spite of it including a Palestinian state. And that the leaders of the Arab world said no. But if you use Israel and apartheid in one and the same sentence, well, then you're not part of a serious real debate. But uh, you and you're also relativizing the suffering of the black population. Thank you, Håkan Svenling. Mr. Spiegel, the, this is uh, the way uh, that arguments are presented by those uh, who are Israel proponents. There's a security threat against Israel as a state. This is true. This is not something any of us deny. But that gives you the right to commit any violation of human rights whatsoever within Israel's borders or in the occupied territories. That's simply not the case. You have to be allowed to criticize this. When I try to Israel for the first time many years ago now, we started by visiting the Arabic and Palestinian minorities in Israel. And I was horrified even at that stage by the fact that they weren't granted planning permission, they're consistently discriminated against in public administration. And then I traveled to Occupy Palestine and I saw the violence. People are exposed to children, boys at the checkpoints, harassment at checkpoints, etc. every day. These are human rights crimes, Larissa Dactuson. You have to have the courage to stand up and defend these people by not standing up to and accepting amnesty's assessment. You're trying to conceal Israel's shortcomings. Mr. Speaker, the other day, The Economist published a democracy index where the countries of the world are being ranked in terms of democracy and human rights. Every year, all countries are evaluated using the same strict criteria. And 17 of 20 countries in the Middle East are being ranked as uh, dictatorships, but Israel is being given the best grade this far and ranked 23 among all the 167 countries, which means that Israel is being given a better grade than Spain, the Baltics, Portugal, Italy, Belgium, and the United States of America. And isn't that very telling? Håkan Svenneling, Israel is a stable democracy and not an apartheid state. Thank you. That concludes that set of rejoinders, as well as all rejoinders to uh, Adaktuson address. And we continue with the next address, which is your Fursal from the Liberal Party, please. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to uh, all the other speakers for an excellent debate. Sweden has so much to be proud of, but we're far from uh, completely finished. But we have issues on democracy and climate and equality, etc., where we can be proud. But we have things to be less proud of. Sweden's history of neutrality, for example, when the forces of good and evil have faced those of good. The old Swedish policy of neutrality has to be replaced by an ideas and values based policy where we never uh, put a hold on the defense for liberal values. In our absolute vicinity, we have Lithuania, Mr. Speaker, a small country, open, reliant on its relations with the world around it. It's a well-developed democracy and a role model in foreign policy in spite of their relative size. They have opted for a values-based foreign policy. In their case, it's, for example, expressed by uh, an ability not to fold in the face of Chinese uh, objections. They've opened a de facto embassy in Taiwan, for example. That should go without saying, Mr. Speaker. Here, this is a pen. This is a piece of paper. Mr. Speaker, and here's Andrea Snorlian sitting. And Taiwan is a country. You can like it or not, but from a political 
science perspective, it is true. Taiwan has a people, there's a geographic territory, there's a functioning state. You cannot circumvent this fact, whether you like it or not. It is also one of the country's eight, well, it's the eighth best functioning democracy. Sweden um, qualified at the, um, position four, Schweiz, the Netherlands and Canada somewhat behind Taiwan, in fact. But we have an example. If we'd had a values-based foreign policy, we would have followed suit after Lithuania in relation to Taiwan. We should deepen the ties between our two countries, our industries, etc. It goes for Sweden and Lithuania. The opinion of a third country, in this case China, is irrelevant. As a liberal politician, you're permanently questioned by thinkers from the left who feel that there are no real free choices. There's no entirely free or unfree choices to make. All choices are influenced by one or other element, but there are more or less free choices. We need to take the fight to have more people be freer. In the case of Taiwan, I'm fairly confident that the people of Taiwan, if they were asked about self-determination, would know uh, what to answer. But the military threat from China is making their position less free. If the question would be, uh, it should be this instead, if there wasn't a risk of an ag aggression by China, would you declare your independence? Well, then I'd be quite convinced that they would say yes, rather than no. The people of Taiwan deserves the right to determine their future in free and independent elections. Our obligation as a democracy is to support this and counteract everything that makes this choice and this uh, determination less free such as the threat from China. When I say all this, it really goes without saying. I wouldn't be surprised if the Chinese embassy would send an upset email to us. They tend to do this. They try to get our publicly elected members of parliament to uh, dance to their tune. I don't accept that. I don't think anyone should else should either. I uh, would uh, be very grateful not to receive any further communications along those lines from the uh, Chinese embassy. And Kush, I mean, the ambassador has sent previous messages. Stop sending threatening messages. It's below my dignity to even respond in any case. China has nothing to do with our relationship with other democracy. We are in a democracy, we say, and express how we feel in uh, this democracy of ours. We'll continue to condemn China's continued uh, threats to human rights and, and the rights of people. The angry letters are becoming a little bit embarrassing. It brings uh, ridicule over the entire country. I pity those who work at the Chinese embassy and who have to live under the dictatorship of Xi Jinping and the pressures and oppression of the, the regime. I will uh, fight for and hope that they will get a chance to live in a democracy in the future. Mr. Speaker, I also feel that the Chinese dictator needs to be brought uh, to uh, trial for all the crimes committed by uh, the, the uh, dictatorship against uh, the uh, Uyghurs, um, citizens in their own country. Lithuania and Taiwan uh, are good examples of what a values-based security policy and foreign policy could mean, putting the legal rights of peoples and other parts of liberal uh, democracy in the forefront. But it doesn't stop there, of course. Development aid should work to promote democracy. Free trade needs to increase so that more people have the right of ownership and can be lifted out of poverty. A feminist struggle for equal uh, rights for men and women needs to be spread globally. And the government, as a point of principle, should not take part in any major sports event or other events in non-democracies. The climate issue has to be resolved in cooperation. EU cooperation should be deepened. Sweden should obviously join NATO. You neither can nor should remain neutral in the matter of democracy or dictatorship, freedom or non-freedom. We need to have a values-based foreign policy. Mr. Speaker, the European security order is under threat by Russia's aggression against Ukraine right now. The responsibility lies entirely with Kremlin, Putin and Russia. Ukraine has the right to decide on its own foreign and security policy. A lot has already been said about this in this debate today, but I want to uh, lay down a few uh, points nevertheless. First First of all, I'd like to make it clear that Sweden should uh, have a rapprochement and join NATO eventually. We were the first to table such proposals. A values-based foreign policy does not shy away from any measures to defend our democracy and our security order. If Ukraine asks for help, Sweden needs to support them in every way we can. Yesterday, the European Parliament voted on financial support. The Sweden Democrats was the only party represented from Sweden who voted against. Sweden should be in favour of 
uh, support from the EU, needless to say. But if Ukraine requests other types of help from Sweden as well, logistics, healthcare, military supplies, or we even weapons, we should also make sure that we are available. If Swedish legislation blocks this in uh, an assessment, we should contribute financially instead to enable weapons purchases by Ukraine. The fact that the UK and not us sent uh, the Swedish manufactured Carl Gustav supplies is quite embarrassing, in fact. There's already a war ongoing in Ukraine, Mr. Speaker, and the Russian aggression, which, has, we've, which we've seen so far, is enough to justify very strict sanctions. Anyone who's not on Ukraine's side is on Moscow's, Putin's and Kremlin's side. Russia's actions against Ukraine is not an isolated event. It's based on the righteous man. Uh, it's part of their idea to have a long-term destabilization in the world and expanding their territory. You cannot talk Kremlin back in uh, to... Uh, a controlled situation. Uh, this is a game that not everyone can uh, win. So, uh, therefore, we need all available resources. A values-based uh, foreign policy doesn't uh, hold back on any of those. Shutting Russia out of the SWIFT payment system or having other sanctions. As a point of principle, Sweden should support all proposed sanctions. Mr. Speaker. Sweden should uh, change our foreign policy doctrine to a values-based one, where we always take this, the fight against anti-democrats, and we defend liberal and democratic values everywhere. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Minister for Foreign Affairs and Linda and Håkan Svenling of the Left Party have asked for rejoinders. And Linda, Minister for Foreign Affairs, first. Thank you, Olof President. Thank you, Speaker. Now, the EU is the most important foreign and security policy arena. It's a position that the Social Democrats and the Liberals, we share that view. And we heard, we've heard we heard today that the Sweden Democrats do not share that view, though. A uh, threat against democracy, uh, human rights and the rule of law has increased in our region and globally, which is why we need a stronger EU that more than ever before. And next year, Sweden is going to hold the presidency of the EU for the third time. And we're going to lift up the right, the issue of... Uh, human rights and the rule of law. The Liberals, do, do you wish to cooperate? How how do you how can you think about cooperating with a Conservative bloc with the Sweden Democrats, which will have a large um, influence over foreign policy? You want for share, please. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, or should I say, senior member of the committee. This is true. The Liberals uh, Party would like to have a deep and EU cooperation. Our vision is to have European Federation further down the line, in fact. And I think that it's worth noting that most major issues in foreign policy cannot be resolved by Sweden independently. Rather, it needs cooperation with other like-minded. And just as the, the minister underlines, the e European Union is our most important tool in foreign policy. When it comes to the matter of Government, I find, first of all, that regardless of which uh, government we have, whether it's one to the right or to the left, after the next election, it will be dependent on either the left party or the Sweden Democrats, and they are both negative to EU cooperation, and none of those two would like to be part of EU cooperation. And Mr. Speaker, or Mr. <laughs> Senior Member of the Committee, the Liberal Party and myself would like to see a right-wing government with a liberal tendency. N not only do we want a right-wing government or one which promotes and protects ownership and would like to expand free trade, believing in the uh, individual and all their individual drivers, we want to have a liberal focus. And this is due to the fact that we are concerned that if the liberals are not part of such a corporation, such a government would be in danger of moving in the opposite direction. We would like to see a right-wing government which would Im will implement liberal reforms, and that is not possible if we were to have a, a right-wing government with the backing only of the Sweden Democrats, Christian Democrats, and with the moderate party. The Sweden Democrats are not a right-wing party. In many um, areas, they have a left uh, uh, focused policy and they have a well-known background, historically speaking. So the Liberal Party is needed in order to ensure the right direction for right-wing government. Thank you. And Elina of Socialdemokraterna? Yeah. 
Thank you, Mrs. Speaker. Now I'm wondering how the Liberals, how far you'll go or wish to go to support a right-wing Conservative bloc, especially bearing in mind that the Sweden Democrats might become the largest party in that constellation. Now you, the Liberals, will you be able to be part of that type of bloc if you can't establish in advance that the EU is our most important foreign and security policy arena? Final rejoinder, please. Thank you, uh, most senior member, and thank you, uh, Madam Minister, for this question. As always, in political cooperation, there's obviously going to be one or other red line. And to me, it's not about influence entirely and only based on the size of the political party, as the minister is well uh, known. It wasn't the case in the so-called January Agreement, or the Social Democrats uh, obtained a lot, but not perhaps entirely in uh, line with the size of their, that party and the alliance government previously had the same situation. It's a giving and a take-in. It's about balancing, and the smaller the party is, the more the greater the influence, in fact, relatively speaking, because it is the vote on the margin which has the impact if you are the 175th uh, vote for the Social Democrats, it's Amin and Kakabawi's vote, and so that member's influence is perhaps disproportionate proportionate to the individual seat that she holds in this chamber, but it is needed in order to keep the Social Democrats in power. Thank you. That concludes this round of rejoinders. Håkan Svenneling has the floor for the left party for the next round of rejoinders. Herr Alders, President. Mr. Speaker, you are for shell now. You uh, said that Lithuania was a good example, and uh, he has reason to do so in a way because has been successful in many areas when it comes to foreign policy. However, there is, of course, one area where Lithuania is well known for not being so prominent, uh, and that when it comes to LGBT rights, where they really are at the bottom of the list or the tables. And in fact, a European parliamentarian from your own group, you have said that LGBT were, uh, people were perverse. And so my question, therefore, you are for sure you want to uh, counter anti people who are anti-democratic and who are bullies. So what do you what's your view with regard to that statement, please? You are for sure. You are for sure, please. It's fruktansvärt. Förlåt. Tack, Herr Alders. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Okan Svenling. This is terrible. That's no way of expressing yourself, and that uh, kind of policy is not acceptable. Foreign uh, policy based on values, it's about protecting the right of human beings, and they are all based on liberal theory, the rights of the individual to their own body, their self ownership the right to love whoever you choose, to say what you wish, the right to uh, ownership, right to, to uh, put your thoughts and opinions in writing, not to have your personal integrity restricted by this, the government, not to have f your financial situation restricted, because there's self-ownership uh, for the individual, regardless of who you are. Every individual is entitled to self-determination, and no one uh, is entitled to uh, decide on behalf of someone else. And it goes without saying that the Liberals represent all those values. When I talk of uh, values-based foreign policy, those are the values I want to defend, and I think they should be defended in every country, everywhere, and always. And I condemn those who fail to do so. It is something that where I could, of course, also find examples of people from the left party or from the left who've said reproachable, uh, who've made reproachable statements or left-wing regimes um, committing terrible uh, offences. And, and uh, Håkan Svenning is well uh, aware of this. Uh, we've debated it many times before. But that does not mean to say that I expect Håkan Svenning to defend all those. And I hope that we can keep this l debate at a reasonably elevated level. I believe, Mr. Speaker, that uh, the member in question is well familiar with the long history of the Liberal Party to be on the side of LGBTQ persons and their rights, both in Sweden and abroad. Thank you. Håkan Svenling, go ahead. 
And you are glad. Mr. Speaker, I'm very happy to hear your uh, view there, and that the and it's very good that the Liberal group, in fact, thrown out, has thrown out this person out of the group. Uh, after having said that LGBT people are perverse, because that's a natural uh, consequence of that type of behaviour. But it does show that even good, so-called good liberals can, may, you know, they might be bad apples in the group in uh, the European Par Parliament and that make statements of that kind. Now, so even if we uh, are positive uh, when it comes to Lithuania in many respects, we need to highlight when the countries are less good, less positive. But then they are also in that committee, there are, are clear nationalistic uh, street or peop people. And I hope that you, Johar uh, Fushel, then you analyse uh, Lithuania's foreign policy in that light. Thank you. That's the end of that round of rejoinders. Thank you. Yes, of course. What I tried to say, and what I also believe that I already stated, in fact, is that Lithuania is a role model in that they have opted to have a foreign policy based on values. They put values above other interests. They uh, have the courage to stand up to defend values, even when the situation is difficult, such as with China, as I mentioned earlier. That's the example I'd like to see Sweden follow. I have a great deal of criticism uh, uh, against some of the policies in Lithuania, and the same goes for other countries, including Sweden. If you meet the Swedish Foreign Policy Committee, you may find that some there are opposed to the EU, some are more prone towards nationalism, others have made uh, questionable statements on this, others on that. And the values I represent are the liberal values, and I uh, and all liberals defend the right of every person to be the person you wish to be. Thank you. This concludes uh, this round of rejoinders, and Maria Pham has the floor for her address for the Green Party. Hello, Mr. President. Mr. Speaker. During election year, we tend to turn our thoughts inwards and focus on domestic policy issues, which is good, it's important and necessary. There, it's good that on a day like this to pause for thought and remember that we are in fact a small part of a much larger world and that our challenges are shared and that we are dependent on each other. Let me start by mentioning the very serious situation between Russia and Ukraine. Russia's aggression against Ukraine violates international law, constitutes a serious violation of Ukraine's sovereignty and is a challenge to the European security order. It's important that the EU continues to show a united front and Sweden must, together with the EU, be prepared to introduce forceful sanctions against Russia with the goal of de-escalating the conflict and supporting Ukraine. The situation is serious. We need to show solidarity with the, with the people whose everyday lives are so hard hit by these fundamental geopolitical power games. The EU recently announced a crisis package of measures for Ukraine. It's positive and we need to continue supporting Ukraine through CEDA, for example, uh, in, with different types of support. Uh, because and that uh, support uh, reinforces the respect of age, uh, human right, rights, reduces the country's impact on the environment, and promotes democracy and sustainable economic development. If we now, we also need to see that we need to invest more in sustainable in Sweden, and in the EU, so that we're not dependent on Russia for our energy today. A fourth of our oil, almost half of the coal, and almost half of the fossil gas used in the EU comes, in fact, from Russia. From January to November 2021, 51% of Sweden's imports of enriched uranium came from Russia. That's according to figures from the Statistics Sweden. It is Vattenfall that uh, purchases nuclear fuel for Ringhouse from a subsidiary to Russian Rosatom that also develops nuclear weapons. And that were also involved in the murder by poison of a former Russian agent and basically is controlled by, in extension, by Putin. Only 10% of the Swedish people are positive uh, to the import of enriched uranium from Russia, which isn't very odd in itself, bearing in mind that Russia already today is using fossil gas to, to, as a form of political pressure. 
we don't want to see uranium and rich urine being used in the same way. For the Green Party, the analysis is crystal clear. The most strategic, the most strategic way forward as regards security policy and most sustainable way forward for the environment and the climate is to expand renewables in, the EU, in Sweden and the EU. The Green Party wants Sweden to continue to pursue its security policy and to continue its policy of non-alignment. Let me be clear on this point. It's important to cooperate with others, but cooperate, cooperating with other states and becoming part of a military alliance with joint defence obligations is a completely different matter. Being free of military alliances increases our possibility to have a dialogue, act as, uh, and also to contribute to de-escalation. And the long-term goal of our foreign and defence policy for us is global disarmament, not to be part of a nuclear weapon umbrella. Sweden has shown the way in a number of ways when it comes to, for example, our feminist foreign and development policies and effective and sustainable development aid policy. This is something we need to continue with. And this means that uh, taking climate change seriously and also to uh, encourage a quick translation as well, and that we also see that... Um, we see also that the boundaries between war and, conflict and peace are becoming more difficult to see. We need to support democracy and to reduce emissions as far as possible. We see already today that climate change both exacerbates existing conflicts and leads to new ones to emer emerging. The destruction of water catchments, the fight for diminishing natural resources, just a couple of examples. In a world where the climate crisis is leading to more wars and disasters, people risking not having sufficient food or being risk being displaced, then in that world, global solidarity is central. The war in Yemen, the oppression in Palestine, persecution in Myanmar, and the Taliban taking over power in Africa are examples where Sweden can and should act. The humanitarian aids are increasing. Never before have so many people been displaced as they are today. The Green Party wants Sweden to become a humanitarian role model that actively saves lives and re reduces uh, marginalisation. We need to also ensure that we development aid goes to people who live in poverty. It should never go to f fund military efforts or be conditional. Sustain uh, Sweden's aid shall be sustainable and help to reduce poverty to meet the climate change, fight corruption, push for peace and stability in the world, all in line with the global sustainable goal, sustainability goals in Agenda 2030. Sweden uh, must maintain the 1% goal for Swedish development aid. Uh, recently, we decided to double Swedish climate aid by 15 billion by 20, uh, 2025 compared to 2009. The, the poorest in the world are least to blame but are affected the most my climate change. Solidarity with all people in the world is a cornerstone of our green ideology and we want Sweden to continue being a role model by supporting developing countries in their realisation of the Paris Agreement. Hu uh, human rights abuses have increased during the pandemic and governments in several countries are using the pandemic as an opportunity to oppress and silence dissidents. Sweden shall be a voice for democracy the freedom of expression, the respect of all freedoms and rights. The freedom of expression is under threat in more and more countries. Palestinian journalists being imprisoned, environmental activists in the Amazon are threatened, imprisoned and murdered. And in Poland, it is increasingly difficult for women to have an abortion. Access to nuclear power is one of the most serious secret security threats where we can, we might in fact eradicate all life on Earth, which is why we want Sweden to become part of the UN uh, treaty on our ban on um, or the prohibition of nuclear weapons, and we want to stop the export of weapons to dictatorships and warmongering, warmongering states. We also want to reinforce the rules for uh, exports linked to weapons. We want an international ban on the development, uh, production and use of fatal military robots. Mr Speaker, now more than ever, the world needs us all to join forces to together meet our global uh, challenges.
challenges. It requires courage, well thought through policies and a belief in the future. We can meet these challenges together. Sweden needs the world and the world needs Sweden. Thank you. Thank you. And the following have requested a rejoinder. Anne Linde, the Social Democrats, Cecil Lundgren from the Centre Party and Lars Adaktusson from the Christian Democrats, please. Firstly, Anne Linde from the Social Democrats. Thank you, Olaf. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. One of the most important priorities of the government is to step up the climate to transition because the climate environmental crisis is acute. We have to reduce emissions and we need to carry out this green transition with adaptations. And here I think that, well, climate and security should be prioritized within policy. And we're already working with the OSCE, the UN, the EU, and we discuss how we together should be able to manage uh, uh, the climate transition. And when we had the chairmanship, we also could discuss uh, these uh, challenges. And uh, the OSCE now has a mandate to work in a preventive manner to increase, increase security in the region and also work with the climate. And you, the Green Party, how do you want to integrate these two aspects? Thank you. Maria Farm, please. Thank you, Olaf. Thank you, Mrs. Speaker. And thank you for the question. Uh, to the Foreign Minister. This is a very important aspect, a very central part of climate change. If we don't do anything to about the climate change, we will be living in a much, un, much more unsafe world. So it's very important to link those two together, which means that the things that you mentioned in your declaration as well, that's positive when it came to climate and security and that Sweden should take and does take active part in that work. Because we see already today that many of the conflicts that we see in the world are in fact a consequence of a lack of natural resources or there's been an extended period of drought that of course have an impact, an impact on security and the ability to cooperate. Which is why I would also say that one of the most important issues that is a consequence of the security challenges and uh, linked to climate is the fact that we need more global solidarity. So when we see challenges or conflicts that are going to become more and more common as we see climate change and the effects thereof spreading, we also, to a much greater extent, need to help each other out, both, for example, through development aid, but also in different ways uh, through security policy, for example. And so we need to react together. Thank you. Foreign Minister, please. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In the work that was being done leading up to SC making this decision, there was a report produced and we used CIPRI among other things. And we know that there are 42 so-called hot spots in the region where climate change might lead to direct conflict. And this is uh, an issue that I hope that we'll also be able to discuss in different manners in the UN conference that will be held in Stockholm, uh, 2nd to 3rd of June, uh, the Stockholm Plus 50. And here we have, uh, among others, uh, previous uh, Green Party minister ministers who have uh, been well, a driving force in uh, making this conference happen, and uh, we think that we'll and hope that we'll have your support, and we hope this will be a success for Sweden and the environment. A final rejoinder. Uh, thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes, obviously, yes, it's going to be very important this work, and and as the foreign minister says, the Green Party has prepared this uh, conference when we were members of the government. So we definitely look forward to cooperating more on that. And so that this cooperation also leads 
somewhere. That's the end of that round of rejoinders. And next we have Shastin Lundgren from the Centre Party, please. Thank you, President. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I have a few questions for Maria Farm, and you're new to these foreign policy debates, and it's interesting to hear. Well, you're no longer part of the government. And I have a question about uh, Hong Kong and what do you think? Hong Kong is one of uh, the vulnerable areas, exposed areas where China uh, is being tough, uh, closing down, imprisoning and uh, breaking apart the democratic movement and uh, will shut down Hong Kong as the, a window of democracy. And the parliament has uh, stated we have a legal aid agreement that has uh, been signed and we have said that it should be abandoned because uh, the rule of law that we see in Hong Kong today is not uh, what it was when we signed the agreement. Would you be willing to support such a requirement? Or do you stick to what you've said before? I'm also curious about, well, you're now an independent party, no longer dependent on uh, the government. And what about uh, the business Sweden office uh, that we have in Tevapir? Could you change the name to House of Sweden? That would also be interesting to learn. And then finally, solidarity. Uh, security policy. Well, you're talking about solidarity, but the, the security policy and to be solidaric there, that has to be that we act if something happens near us. Are you willing to participate in such a decision, please? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Shastin Lungin, for and welcome to the committee and the debate. For that, welcome to the committee and the debate, sorry. Now, we uh, haven't decided to change our position with regard to Hong Kong and ta Taiwan. Uh, we may do so in the future, but it's nothing that uh, we're going to do in the here and now. And as regards security policy, which uh, shows solidarity, as I expressed in my intervention, we are very clear that we don't want to be part of NATO. We think that the EU is in a very important arena for cooperation. And when it comes to defense cooperation, we have, we do cooperate with NATO and uh, also with Finland, with exercises, etc. And we should continue with that, we believe. We're not excluding any type of cooperation internationally, uh, and we've also participated in other uh, arenas before. Thank you. Shashin Lungin, please, from the Centre Party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, I hope that the Green Party has uh, such a uh, development potential when it comes to this uh, legal aid agreement in Hong Kong so that we can support uh, those who fight for justice. And the same thing with House of Sweden in Taipei, where uh, Taiwan also needs our support. But I'm wondering... I asked a question about solidarity in our security policy. And we have a unique Swedish clause saying that if something happens in the Nordics, in the EU, Sweden will help out. And this is a solidarity clause that actually is important because it's a signal to the world around us saying that we're willing to act also with military means. If a neighboring country is attacked, then a Swedish military will participate. Are you willing to act in that respect? The final rejoinder. Well, that's a decision that has been made and where, where it's quite simply it's a fact. For the Green Party, we have 
been part of producing defence policy and drawing up uh, defence policy with many different parties for many years. And that uh, decision was a part of that. And similarly, the fact that we are a member of the European Union is also a fact. That's an important arena, both as regards the defence decision and our EU cooperation. Are they just a matter of fact. Thank you. That's the end of that round of rejoinders. Next, we have a rejoinder from Lars Adaktusson from the Christian Democrats, please. Mr. Speaker, I as well would like to say welcome to Maria Farm to the committee and also welcome the fact that she is talking about the importance of showing solidarity with Ukraine. But let me also note that there is one area that the Green Party is not talking about and that is the security situation in Europe and what it would have looked like had Ukraine been a member of NATO. And uh, the NATO stabilizing role cannot uh, be overestimated. It would be nice if uh, you, the Green Party, could let go of uh, this old image of NATO and just said, look at reality. That the Green Party has uh, these uh, deeply rooted ideas also when it comes to the nuclear power. Well, that was uh, seen uh, through an article in Aftonbladet, a Swedish uh, tabloid, where, well, talked about uh, enriched uh, uranium and Maria Ferm writes that uh, the Christian Democrats are closing their eyes to that fact. But, Mr. Speaker, we Christian Democrats we fight for Swedish security, and that is why we want to include nuclear power in the EU taxonomy, because that is how to create the necessary prerequisites for a green transition, reduction of emissions of greenhouse gases, and that way we can reduce the dependence on Russian gas and Russian uranium alike. No to nuclear power, that is a yes to Russian gas. And a no to NATO, that means that the Russian threat remains. And when will the Green Party let go of this ideology and see the reality instead, as it is? Thank you. Thank you, Maria Farm. Thank you, Olus President. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Lars Agdokterson, for welcoming me to the committee and also for your question. I think it's very important that we discuss energy policy, security policy, when we discuss security policy and take it seriously. But we, I do not agree with you on the fact that we need to include nuclear power in the taxonomy or gas. I don't think that will help us security-wise. We are still dependent on enriched Russian uranium, and therefore we are. We can see what can happen very quickly if Russia decides to use their its power over Europe and the supply of energy to Europe in that way. I mean, it's very clear that. The security-wise, the most secure th form of energy is, of course, renewable, and it's also the best for the climate and the environment, and something which today is actually cheapest as well. I think it's a greater problem, or what's the greater problem here is that the moderate party are saying that have stopped uh, the expan expansion of uh, wind power. Otherwise, we would have had a better situation when it comes to energy uh, and supply of energy this winter. It would have been easier on our wallets and better for our future environment, actually. Thank you. Lars Adaktusson, please. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We've seen the policy of the Green Party for seven years now when in government. And uh, we have seen how 
the party has had this campaign against nuclear power and how that actually has uh, contributed to our dependence on oil and uh, gas and coal. And that is the situation we have uh, this winter. And um, uh, the bill has been sent to the Swedish citizens. Instead of working in a constructive way, you're locked into ideology. And that means that Sweden is now more vulnerable in this very uncertain situation we're in. So the question remains, when will the Green Party understand that the more we facilitate European nuclear power, the quicker we reduce our dependency on Russia? Thank you. Final rejoinder. Mr. Speaker, what you're saying there, Lars Hardup, isn't true, because the energy policy that we've had in Sweden for many years has been there's been a broad agreement the green party uh, were part of it, but there were some parties that agreed on that policy to pursue and the idea has been a stable uh, long term rules and during this period two reactors have closed and they've closed because they have been profitable today it's even less profitable if we were to come up with the possibility of building a new uh, nuclear power station that uh, where Finland have done that, and, and Finland is getting help from Russia to build those new nuclear power stations. At the same time, there's been a wind power revolution, and which might, in fact, or could lead to better cost-efficient electricity and better supply of energy, more sustainable over time, and which we could export as well any surplus to other countries. This is definitely the way forward, both as regards the security and the environment. That's the end of that round of rejoinders. And that's the end of the uh, interpretation at the foreign political debate. Thank you. Herr Olders president, samtidigt som vi inleder den här andra halvan av debatten så återupptas försvarsberedningens arbete i det allvarliga läge vi befinner oss i. Och en av de som deltar där är han som borde stå här nu, Ken G. Forslund, vår ordförande i utrikesutskottet. Så han deltar inte, men han har bett mig att framföra en hälsning till ledamöterna och en förhoppning om en spänstig debatt. Men det är sagt. Herr Olders president, hela världen står nervöst på tå och väntar på nästa drag. Kommer ryska trupper utöka invasionen av Ukraina? Hela landet eller delar? Hur kommer Belarus vara inblandat? Kommer Putin våga riskera det extremt höga pris det kan innebära om Ryssland fortsätter sin aggression? Kommer EU, NATO och det övriga världssamfundet fortsätta stå eniga? Vad kan lösa ut situationen? Inte på flera decennier har, har säkerhetsläget varit så här allvarligt i Europa. Barn i Sverige kommer oroliga hem från skolan och undrar till sina föräldrar. Kommer det bli krig nu? Många frågor och ingen har alla svar. Inte heller jag, men några saker vet jag. Det är Ryssland som är den aggressiva parten. Det är Ryssland som hotar andra länder med våld. Det är Ryssland som ifrågasätter inte bara den europeiska säkerhetsordningen utan hela den världsordning som har byggts upp efter världskrigen och det kalla kriget. Det är Ryssland som redan har ockuperat delar av grannländerna Georgien och Ukraina. Jag vet att det är Ryssland som kväser opposition internt och fängslar både journalister och politiker som misshagar dem. Det är Ryssland som ligger bakom förgiftningar, mord och mordförsök på ryska oppositionella i andra länder. Jag vet att det inte är NATO som är den aggressiva parten här. Den propaganda som Ryssland sprider går ut på att moder Ryssland är det stackars offret som omringas av fiender. Där USA och deras lydiga europeiska lakejer utgör ett existentiellt hot mot ett Ryssland som bara försvarar sig självt. Och illa behandlade rysktalande minoriteter i omgivande länder. Jag vet att de här påståendena är desinformation. En del 
av statsstöd rysk hybridkrigföring. Jag önskar verkligen att gemene man i Sverige 